first or second question. You don't have to answer uh, both in the interest of time, but if I can pick on the group on the right. I'm. So, do we keep picking? I'm no, no, first. no. It's, it's okay. good. I, I maximize the time of our group, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I will share my thoughts, <laughs> um, and, and hopefully they agree to some extent. Um, so the biggest area that we talked about um, was really the intersegmental collaboration. I think that it touches on a little bit of number two as well, advancing equity for prioritizing. And we did, I'm talking about second question, the prioritize and learn more about. Um, and so in my personal experience, um, I know that we talked a lot about the UCs and the CSUs, but I think what's missing in that equity part of the conversation is California's private institutions. Um, my experience with transferring to Pepperdine from uh, CCC was not the smoothest. Um, and it's not necessarily the journey that all of our students will face, but there are there is USC and other private institutions here that um, while the focus will always be CSUs and UCs because those are, those are our state schools, to leave out of the private institutions in those pathways and ability for students to go where they want in their education, um, which is why I was excited about the Cal Grant increase for private institutions too, but that's separate. Um, I think that uh, it's definitely, that needs to be included. Um, and that touches on the equity portion too. I think the advancing equity, um, looking at online education, we keep talking about this why for students, um, why are they leaving and not coming back um, and on the ground, working with students and seeing them on a day-to-day -day basis, the students that I see, my friends, they say they don't want to come back because there's not online access. It's not flexible for them. Um, they got used to it in the pandemic, and we can't just switch a, like flip the switch back to what it was before. And I don't necessarily think what it was before was actually equitable. Um, students who don't have access to transportation or housing or are part of the communities that we were reading or learning about earlier about the percentages for black students and Latinx students and Native American students. These are the students that have jobs and families and obligations outside of school that they need that online education that the for-profits are currently offering, which is why before the data was always increasing in times that our enrollment was uh, declining. So I think that, that the equity is another one we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you very much, board member Elizondo. Or, or President I'll, I'll, No, I'll, I'll hold off on this particular comment until a little bit later, I think. But we, we, should, we should go next. Go, go, go. <laughs> okay. right. So our, ours is about time to completion. Um, so decrease the median units to complete in excess of 60 by 15% of the units and establish system-wide stretch goals regarding the number of students completing or transferring within the minimum amount of time necessary. So that one, you know, we believe is um, important. Um, I think you can even get into affordability, less units, less money spent. Um, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, what is up for me as a student, I couldn't get out of community college until they had an accelerated program, Weekend Express, and I was able to get out of there and uh, still never got an associate's degree, but you know, I transferred. And um, so that's the area that we are ready to lead on and the area that we believe needs to be prioritized. All right, group on the left, who wants to be here? I, I guess I'll jump in. Go ahead. Um, so the area that we thought we might be able to lead uh, best in uh, was uh, workforce. Um, there, there's a lot of programs um, that aren't necessarily fully aligned, um, but we're doing them. And so in many ways, we already are uh, a workforce leader um, and uh, we can get better, of course, but, but that's an area where um, at the, the local level, departmental level with our business advisory groups and, and things like that, that are faculty engaged with, um, we, we have the most likelihood to stay uh, really closely aligned with what the workforce and, and the employers need. Uh, areas where I think um, we, we'd want to prioritize over the next few months particularly um, are, is the intersegmental collaboration and uh, particularly around um, the data alignment uh, because as we uh, start to unpack that and understand that better that is going to help inform many of the other efforts that we put into this. 
So uh, really making sure that the alignment is there and that the data is there so we can make proper data informed decisions. Thank you, that's great. Thank, thank you for focusing on workforce for the drawings and, and left team. <laughs> President Haynes, you have closing comments. So yeah, um, as we as we build out online, we have to we have to have, there's lessons, um, and 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 we and we really do have to really um, dissect those lessons. Um, and when we look at some of that data, our African American students in particular did not do well in that environment. And, um, and so, and their preference in coming back after the pandemic, they're doing some online, but they really want, they need and want that face-to-face -face and we, we have to accommodate that. Um, and so, and, and, there, and, and there is a struggle between online where students feel that they really did do well and the, and, the, and the need of constituency groups that say, we need to build back on, uh, back on ground. So what I would say um, is we have to meet students where they are. And again, this is about flexibility, not for, not for us, not for faculty, not, not for them, but for students who we want to come back. Um, and so that means a redesign. And it also means professional development because um, that flexibility can't be um, um, uh, synchronous and asynchronous. It, be, be, that, it has to be embedded with even our online um, presence. And so uh, again, I, I just think that we really need to keep that center most in as we think about, uh, about that piece. I want to thank you for your discussions and for uh, engage. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize, Board Member Shaw, uh, for missing your hand. I apologize. <laughs> okay. No, I don't have a hand, Deb. All right. Oh, apologies. Did I, did I realize? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No worries. If you have any comments or um, Board Member um, uh, Villalobos has anything to say, please do. Board member Villalobos. Yeah, he has his hand up. Uh, okay. Yeah, just one, one comment I wanted to make was, uh, one, I, I completely agree with member Elizondo's uh, comments earlier uh, in that, you know, we have, I believe, gotten used to accessing, uh, you know, education um, online. It's, uh, it's convenient. It makes it easier for those who need to work full time or need to work part time to, to obtain education um, in a flexible way, if you will. One thing I would uh, I would like to focus on and make sure we keep an eye out on is the uh, how that may impact our, our veterans. We need to be very careful, especially with veterans and dependents who are using the GI Bill benefits. Um, we need to be very careful to make sure, you know, making sure that any policies that we implement that will allow, let's say, can continue to allow students to access uh, education, online education, that those are, um, that we're tracking what the VA is doing in terms of policies and how the veterans and, and military family members may be impacted by it. Uh, they have, the VA has very specific guidelines on that. And so we need to make sure that uh, whatever we do on our end um, does not impact our veteran population in a way that they miss out on their benefits and or then have to pay money back to the VA and that applies to dependents as well. Thank you for highlighting that and for speaking up for our, our veteran student population and the working learner population. Definitely making a note about recognizing the cross segment alignment of these policies with federal policies as well. So we make a note of that. Okay. Add a couple. So I uh, just share two thoughts on sort of. I, just, I love the comments. Um, the first, just sort of first thought that I had was, I love how student centered uh, your perspectives are just by uh, just on the natural. Like what you're basically saying is, we need to value students' time. 
So that's what I hear when I say, you know, when I hear like we have to prioritize time to completion because students don't have time to take five credits don't, that don't count towards anything <laughs> towards their goals. Uh, likewise, we need to, you know, make sure that we're solving for their preferred mod modalities. Like if they don't have lives that are really well accommodate in person learning, then we need to be mindful of that. And then lastly, in terms of workforce connection, we need to make sure that, especially for students who see education as an opportunity to better their, you know, free economic mobility, basically, that, you know, that value proposition is real and that, that's a real promise there as opposed to just sort of um you know something that might be difficult to navigate it might be hit or miss and so that's certainly what i overall hear and what i love too around uh, uh board president haynes uh your uh comments around online learning is you know it's at the end of the day uh there's something beautiful about the fact that we all agree on what we should do which is we should be solving for what students want uh now how to get there what what the right sort of mix where where on the spectrum that is in terms of online learning like learning modalities we'll have different methods of getting there we'll want to collect data on like survey data and listen to students and see how the data is playing out in terms of enrollment rates and things like that but overall and i think that we should acknowledge and recognize and honor the fact that you know piece of good news is we all agree on the end goal which isn't always the case uh, and so I find that's very much a common theme in California is we believe in the end goals. We don't really have to dispute or debate equity and all these other things. It's actually, we all more or less have the vision of what we want our systems to look like for our students. And it's mostly a matter of getting everyone, uh, herding all the cats and getting one, <laughs> everyone aligned and actually you know, kind of doing the legwork. So really appreciate the comments. Well, thank you for that conversation. I want to wrap us up with uh, two quick points. One is that um, we will continue to monitor our progress on the roadmap, begin the work of uh, supporting our districts, our students, our, our campus leaders, our faculty and staff, and what it takes to leverage the investments in this budget, this multi-year commitment to reach the roadmap goals. One of our commitments is that we'll establish baseline data for many of these uh, points. And then we'll also integrate uh, these uh, goals and uh, reports into our state of the system so that we can be open and transparent about where we're seeing progress and we're seeing big wins from our system and our system leaders and where we still have work and we may need to learn more. I want to end with a one of my favorite texts that I got this morning was from uh, a, a CEO in a central uh, valley or coastal central valley that was sending a first day of uh, campus or first day of the semester photo. And it was uh, him and his son. He values that what community colleges can do uh, so much so that he knows that it's the best option and the best value that uh, he can get um, in California by going to a community college. I want us to, have, to be to entrust uh, ourselves, our system, so that we are com comfortable and confident that our children, our sisters, our brothers, our siblings, our aunts and uncles will go through a community college and that will be the best choice and then they will be successful. That's how much we need to love this system and care about the progress because at the end of the day, every single one of these Californians are one of our own and we should care about their success as much as we care about those in our family. So thank you for this collab uh, collaboration and important discussion. We'll get to hear from students next. I'll turn it back to Board President Hayes and Chancellor Gonzalez. So this is, this is actually the next portion of this is a working lunch. Is that correct? Um, do we have lunch here? Yes. It was going to be in the side room where your closed session is. So we so so we bring the lunch into this room. Here's what I propose. One, let me just thank Ben for spending. I'm the so time sorry. With us. <laughs> ben, thank, thank you. you so much for coming. <laughs> forward to bringing you back I think the next step for us is really to think about how the vision is ready to lead California's future and taking the roadmap and really aligning it I tracked four different things as I was hearing the board think about whether we were ready or not where we really need to think critically of whether we have set the bar high enough 
And I think it's a great opportunity for the board to engage in this work next. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Are we able to ask them questions or are we just going straight into the working lunch? Because they said a lot of stuff that I feel like. Oh, you should, yeah, speak up. Yes. Speak up. <laughs> Fine. You should speak up. Speak up. Because I, I, saw, I saw Chief De Deputy Chan Cabinet Secretary stand up, and I just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to address some comments. So I have two comments. One question for the chief and then one question for the staff. So my first comment is thank you. Um, one of our commitments for the visions for success is pair high expectations with high support. And I think the governor's office did exactly that. And most of the time we're complaining about how we don't have money and now we have money and, and now we're speechless because we don't know what to do because we have that support. So thank you for being here. Thank you for leaning in and we appreciate you. Um, my second comment is that there may be a, this expectation that the vision for success ends in 2022. And I think the governor's office made that incredibly clear that this actually goes through 2026 and 2027. So if there was any doubt that our mission ended, so to speak, it should be abundantly clear that it has not ended, it has elevated and it's been supported right. by the governor, by the entire state. So equity is the mission. It's our North Star, to borrow some terms from, from President Haynes. There, is, there should be no doubt on the table that this is what we're doing. So my question to you is, um, there is this vision for success. There's now the governor's roadmap. But when I see us moving forward, it's like us moving forward, but still carrying this anchor from what may be confusing, if not contradictory guiding documents. I've heard K through 12, I now hear TK through 16, but I also think about us being in this, this situation of being one of the three systems of critical higher education systems in the state of California. So I wanted to hear from you about how we are contextualizing this, how we're not considering the roadmap or the vision for success as a band-aid and how we're truly thinking about a transformation. And then because I'm gonna get everything out, everything out and just pass the microphone over to you guys. My question for the staff is, how are we making sure that students don't think that they are just the recipient of information that's swirling around them, that they are not just at the center of a tornado and then you get uh, Chancellor Gonzalez who steps on campus or, or Chief Cheetah who's trying to navigate the, the education system and there's no innate sense of navigation because what I think we did here was we underestimated the ability of students to go off-roading with their education. They are making decisions, they're making bold decisions, and we need to figure out how the, the messaging is getting to them and empowering them about how they move through the higher education system before they even get there. So, turning the microphone over to you. Yeah, I'll offer some thoughts on this. So the first point around, uh, you know, messaging and aligning on messaging and being synced up is critical. Uh, one of the things I tell some of, because I, you know, my role is basically sitting on top of a massive sort of bureaucracy is the reality of it, which is like, oh, great, I love my, my colleagues. Um, and so uh, what I tell them sometimes though, is they get very sort of tied up into the weeds, like, well, this trailer bill language is precisely like this or like this, right? And you're like, okay, totally agree. I'm glad that we're being diligent about all of that work. But what we're talking about is a true transformation and the evidence of that is over $100 billion altogether that's going into it. And so it's not going to get lost in the system. Uh, so what we're trying to drive is true transformation. What it takes is, frankly, vision and communication. Um, one of the things I tell uh, my agency and finance colleagues is like, yeah, like trailer bill, great. But like <laughs> the new deal. Like the new deal was not defined by the code that was written or the regs that were promulgated. The new deal is a vision for what government can do for people. And so we have to do something similar here, which is we have to communicate and we have to enlist and we have to marshal people towards a common vision. That is big picture what we're doing here. It's not the sort of wonky, you know, the wonkiness is important. The program criteria and the grant guidelines are important. But having said, and the auditing guide is important, but having said that, at the end of the day, transformation of this nature requires a different type of buy-in that has to be socialized all the way down from the leaders, uh, all the leaders and doers from across the state. And so to me, it's really important to align on that messaging. I totally agree that like, there's a lot of different ways that we're uh, sort of messaging right now around you know different words and phrases that are being used. To me, like this is the work ahead. We launched a bunch of stuff 
but you know, the real work is over the next five years and trying to communicate this, trying to keep everyone singing on the same music sheet and, and uh, trying to inspire people is the name of the game for the next five years. And the, you know, the finalizing the roadmap to me is not the end of the enterprise, it is the very beginning of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your comments around reminding us that the vision for success continues to be our, our, our North Star, that the governor himself has joined us in that important work. Um, and so and what funded is it? And they funded, funded it. it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Made a multi-year commitment as well, um, and a multi-year commitment that we're also making to our students. And to that end, um, I would lean into the work that has begun around the social determinants, which is really thinking about not just addressing one key component, but really that, that student's full journey, um, in especially how they access resources and how they intake information. Uh, if we don't understand that well enough and, and how that changes and evolves now very quickly, um, you can't really reflect what students need. And to that point, I'll make another um, observation, which is the vision for success uh, asks us to make seven commitments. One of them is to design with students in mind. And when you hear from our students, they'll actually say, don't just design with us in mind, design with us at the table. At the table, yeah. Because Absolutely. the pace of education, the pace of technology, the pace of lingo is changing so quickly that we have to have students at the table to understand what they need. And I think that's what you'll hear next yeah. and that I want to encourage all of our campuses and we will continue to model as well. Can I, I, I do have a request because, you know, just thinking about lessons learned from um, previous communications, I think how this is messaged, branded, and all of that stuff is really, really important because there's a lot of documents. And I'm, while it might be clear to the people in this row, room, but there's 72 districts out there, I would like an opportunity for us to see before you start communicating so that we can give feedback because. I know how guided pathways was communicated. You know, the feeling at the district level was this is a program versus it being a framework. And so um, I would like the opportunity for us to kind of see, because we got to be really intentional while it, because again, it's clear to us here, but um, you know, districts are completing strategic plans right now and they're doing a lot of different things. And so how we, we got to get the message on that, the vision for success is alive and funded um, and really be intentional about it, even from our website and what we're saying and think is really important. So I just would like to have that opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think it's, there's a lot of, of synergies, but it's it can get mucked up and confusing yeah. to people who aren't in the middle of it every day. Yeah. So figuring out how best to get the message out and, and to show the connections, I think it's gonna be really important. Let me tell you, this is my top anxiety. I tell people this all the time because I feel like sharing the anxiety makes me feel better about it. But it's like, it's the, it's the thing that like I go to sleep with anxiety anxious about and go to wake up in the morning anxious about, which is the extent to which we're able to get buy-in from actual, from the leaders and doers on the ground. So that's what matters. Like I, I, I come in with the experience of, you know, I taught in uh, New York City at a time when ed reform was the big, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of energy around ed reform. Let me tell you, like almost none of those policies remain in place. Why? Because they weren't able to achieve buy-in. They tried to move very fast. It was very much a top-down, guess what, everybody? You're all doing this now. And then everyone kind of was like, yeah, well, we'll see how long you last. And then <laughs> it, sure enough, like it's gone now. And so it's like, in my mind, it's like the, the move has to be, no matter how much it takes, how long it takes, the move has to be to actually get, you know, the teacher when I was in the classroom, for example, like, you know, trying to drive towards the vision. They don't need to know every piece of the roadmap and all every like statute, but what they should know is what we're trying to drive towards. And they should be trying to manifest that in their own classroom and that every campus leader should be trying to manifest it on their campus. And that's how, like, that's the thing that I feel like is the biggest challenge. Um, but that's the, you know, unless we get that accomplished, it's, you know, it's all for not. I mean, we're still, I think, struggling to get, we were talking about it earlier today, to get people to, in, the, in our system to really understand the vision for success and now we're going to add this new thing which is important and great but we just have to 
it's a it's a multi-year effort as you said and you can call it whatever you want you don't need to give the governor any no, credit like it's honestly like whatever it. works just we just yeah. want to we just want to see the, the you know <laughs> and i think as we do this discussion and, and we we start kind of re-communicating mm -hmm. these goals and the commitment and and really highlighting the fact that there's there's really a much deeper level of support with it mm -hmm. it gives us the opportunity though to also communicate deeper right mm -hmm. than even we did with the vision for success because so much of the vision for success was dependent on the local districts really communicating it the way we wanted them to and here we have an opportunity programmatically in policy through policy really talking to the practitioners that are implementing it mm -hmm. because you've got funding you've got expectations associated with it and so now you're going to have the institutions and the programs itself kind of focusing on it and we can really get into you know what are we trying to do what are the values in it uh, how should this feel if we're doing it right mm -hmm. yeah and we have some that have really been very successful and have a track record yeah. And so we can begin to de develop and help to develop sort of best practices. Right. These are the mistakes we made in the beginning, but mm -hmm. we found another option. It, it, and, and I think that's an important conversation to have. Yes. Um, not here, but in our on our college campuses and in our districts. Why well, I'm both chancellor and deputy, so I'm going to keep us moving. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just end here, though, because I think it's important as we head into the next phase of what we're going to do today. You're going to hear about the roadmap again today. You're going to hear from students first, but it is very important that as we move forward to think about the future, that we're not just communicating the vision, but we're helping people understand their role within the vision, because yeah. this board has a very different role than what our districts play our college presidents and all of the stakeholders. And so that's really what we're trying to deploy. And that's what we mean by getting buy-in, right? Do our campus leaders understand their role in getting to the outcomes that we want? And so I want you to think about that as we head into the last section, both Marty and I have been taking copious notes to bring us back to what it means, but this was very intentional. President Haynes was very clear that this board needed to understand the roadmap to the future. So thank you, President Haynes, and that this was touch point number one, right? And so what's next is what you all build together in partnership. So we're excited. So let me give you a five minute break. We're gonna get set up for the student panel and uh, it is a working lunch. So five minutes, quick break while we set up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm gonna wrap. virtually joining us virtually we have uh, the president of the student senate for california community colleges a fantastic leader uh, student leader elected by his peers um, who brings a wealth of knowledge and information and student experience as a veteran adult working learner so we'll get to hear from him as well uh, to my left, we have um, also uh, recent uh, community college graduates uh, so that we can have a conversation of what the vision is meant to students that have seen the system evolve over the last few years um, and can share a little bit kind of in the retrospect about uh, what we can learn. So Catherine Squire, uh, who um, oh, just recently graduated from uh, UC Berkeley, thanks for coming to college, um, and wanted to take this one to congratulate her also, who recently was accepted to be a Capital Fellow. Um, so you see our community college students excelling thanks to the great foundation that our college has provided. And then we have Jen um, Delanaldo, who many of you may have seen join us at um, student listening tours and conversations. Uh, she uh, recently graduated from Los Rios Community College District. Justin started at um, Sac State. Uh, she's a policy leader uh, as well as a fierce advocate for students and, and their voices. We want to have a conversation um, uh, with them. So I'll start with some questions, but I want to encourage you to ask your own. So 
Let me start um, with a question for both Catherine and Jen, uh, who have seen, you know, essentially the before and after with Vision for Success, you have know, seen um, what community college education can provide. So from your perspective, what has been uh, the greatest impact of the Vision for Success? So let's start with you, Catherine. Um, of course, and thank you. Firstly, I want to thank uh, Lisette for inviting me for the invitation. Um, it's kind of nostalgic to be back, but <laughs> I'm happy to be able to be here. Um, I think there's a few um, things that have definitely summed up the greatest impacts of the vision for success. Um, I think the biggest thing that comes to mind is definitely the DEI work we've seen over the course of the last few years. Um, working to reduce equity gaps and focusing on addressing basic needs. I think especially in the era of COVID, uh, I think that's been amazing work. I've seen so many resources emerge in the past few years uh, that colleges are starting to utilize. And I mean, I got the privilege to work on a lot of that as well and be involved with the listening tours and all of that. So I think that's, that's definitely been um, such an amazing accomplishment of the vision for success. Um, secondly, I think a concept that has really become so powerful over the past few years is this idea of designing with the student in mind. Um, I feel like the chancellor's office and a lot of our partners have definitely taken the initiative to really get to know our students, uh, get to know what issues are specific to different student populations. And I think that's just really important um, and really getting them in on all the conversations that are so relevant. Um, especially with now seeing so many students on committees and um, seeing how involved they are with not just bringing their thoughts and experiences, but also the ideas that they have for making our, our system better. So I think that's um, a huge accomplishment. I mean, I just recently saw that the chancellor's search committee uh, for hiring is going to have students on it, which I would have never even thought about that. But I think that's just such an amazing um, accomplishment to have and, and seeing students really get involved with that at the highest level. So, thank you, thank you very much. And, and absolutely, um, having a conversation about computers and uh, how they'll help us and support us. Thank you for also for your work uh, in including DEI uh, within our system. I want to turn to you, Jen, um, and ask you the same question from your perspective. What do you see as the greatest impact that the Vision for Success has had? So when I look at the Vision for Success as a community, as now a former community college student, I look at that as a very strong affirmation of the chancellor's office supporting and ensuring that students are at the very forefront. For background, I started at Sacramento City College in August of 2019, and I only have one semester of, of college on campus before going entirely online. Looking at that vision for success and seeing what it offered to really ensure that our students were at the forefront absolutely changed my life and made me think about how grateful I am to have been a proud byproduct of, byproduct of the California Community College system. There's one quote particularly that I do want to take from looking at that document that's on the website and it reads as follows. It is clear that our students are suffering from the collective traumas of the past year, the pandemic and resulting in financial devastation, a nationwide reckoning with systematic and institutional racism, a tumultuous election and worsening of so social divisions fueled by disinformation. The multiple cries of the last year have left us all feeling untethered, but this past year has also offered us an opportunity to see more clearly the resilience of our students and the values of our institution. And I'm so incredibly thankful that this is the affirmation as my former colleague has already stated, this business of success really does put our students at the forefront at first because these students make the community and college exactly what it is. You can't have a community college without unity, and in that unity, that is through our students. So that includes uh, furthering our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, ensuring that our students are going to be able to succeed, even though realizing that they are going to have multiple and tumultuous challenges along their way, but still ensuring that they're going to succeed and get that two-year degree and then transfer to a four-year afterwards. Also recognizing and realizing the problems that students are going to be facing along the way. We have enough, we're in an election year right now, and I know that's going to be a 
crazy. Also recognizing and realize that our students need mental health now more than ever. And then, uh, and then looking and taking a very honest look at each of our student populations. There's a multitude of underserved student populations that I heard this group talk about in addition to even looking at stats on the chancellor's office. I can't even speak, speak um, even further to it or enough about how I'm glad that this vision for success is going to serve our students. I'll be frank, and even though I'm a CSU student now, our system does it better than any other system. And I, am, I have no problem saying that, but we also need to recognize within the system too, as well, there are some improvements that need to be made and that vision for success um, gives the, the basic foundation for that and for the Chancellor's Office to work more on that I can that I hope and can't wait to see in the next coming years. I have a younger brother who just started at, Sac at Sacramento City College and I told him about the vision success and the first thing he said to me is I am so glad to be part of a system that is going to ensure my success and work for me and ensure that I can succeed because he had the opportunity to go somewhere else but I'm lucky enough to well, maybe kind of force him to go into this, <laughs> the CC system. Um, it doesn't help that his big sister happened to be all in the space, but that is that is exactly what I want to hear from other fellow students. And I tell them all the time, look at the vision for success. And if that doesn't line up for you, for you then I don't know what to tell you, but <laughs> this is what the CC system is. This is what the chances of is doing for you. And if there's something that you want to see come from it that's not already listed in there, that's where you go and tell them so that they can include it in there because this system is going to work for you. That's why I'm so thankful that there's a board here that supports these students. I'm also glad that there's an amazing staff that's going to continually fight hard for our students and advocate for them through the vision of success and uphold those very values, not now, not, not going into tomorrow, but for however long that could be. And I hope that's for literally all of eternity. I, I want to I want to flag a couple of pinpoint a couple of things that Jen highlighted that affirmation that students belong and that the vision is designed for their success. But the that's an important thing that um, that is valuable for us to really take in and why this work is so important. I want to turn next to Lama Trevelon, uh, who's uh, joining us virtually. One benefit of the, you know, the silver lining of the pandemic is that we recognize that we can engage with our students from throughout the state without disrupting their schedules too much, recognizing that they have a lot of responsibilities and commitments. So I really want to thank uh, President Trevelon for joining us. Uh, as a you know, former uh, retired uh, U.S. Navy veteran, um, was an advocate for uh, post-traditional learners, um, and I want to kind of uh, turn to a different question, which is, um, you uh, highlight one of the vision commitments, which is designing with students in mind. You remind us that it needs to be designing with students at the table. Can you share more? about what that means to you and why it's important to design with students at the table. Well, we've seen all of the, the, the positive uh, uh, results from designing with the student in mind. Um, but we'd like to build on that with designing with the students at the table. And what that helps you do is it, it moves from uh, making assumptions about student needs uh, to where we're listening to student needs. Um, you get a better understanding of the of the actual student struggles and needs that are, are occurring from the students on on the campuses, especially as we move back to more in person and present. Um, better collaboration between faculty and students, especially in the focus of curriculum development, course creation, and programming. And overall, you get a better experience for students when students feel like we're a, a part of the process and we are a part of that process. However, uh, there are some, require, some requirements for it to actually work. Um, and it does require more work from administrators, faculty, and even uh, us as student leaders in the recruiting of students to be a part of the process. Uh, and things to uh, be remembered in that in order for it to be equitable for students, uh, keeping in mind that everyone else uh, is paid to be at the table. Uh, the students need to be compensated for their time uh, on these boards. Um, and also, um, you need to help students understand that their voice is actually equal in the conversation so that they're uh, heard and that their voices and concerns are listened to, um, which will increase more uh, collaboration. 
And thank you for, for reminding us about the importance, right? That we move from making assumptions about what students need to actually asking them what they need and then designing uh, to meet those needs. I want to ask specific questions to each of you. Each bring uh, an experience that will help um, our board of governors, our campus leaders, our staff really think about the next steps in implementing the next uh, phase of the vision for success and keeping that movement going. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to ask you again at first, but can you tell us about your experience as a transfer student and what worked? And you know what would you improve? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I attended UC Berkeley after transferring from San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. Um, I majored in political science, and I just recently graduated this past May. I think. Uh, Can we clap for that? Can we just? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so my transfer experience, I really just valued the professors. I got the privilege of taking class from. Um, many of them were researchers, contributed to a lot of the research, research that I read in community college. So it was really a privilege to get to interact with them, take class from them. Um, they were challenging and encouraging, and I just really learned a lot from them. Um, and I felt that my community college education really prepared me uh, for the rigor of those classes as well. I felt like I, I received a really good foundation. Um, and the, the current job I'm working at post-graduation now, I just feel really content with just my education overall. Um, I feel like it's definitely helped me utilize my skills. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to graduate with no debt and just having that financial freedom because I went to community <coughs> college, there's really no better feeling than that <laughs> as a student. Um, that just graduated and doesn't really know what they're what they're doing next. So I think that's um, due due in large part because of community colleges. So also because of the the huge financial aid reforms we've seen over the past few years. So um, I really love that that's something that has come from the vision for success. Um, I think as far as what needs improvement. Um, similarly, as we just heard from the previous presentation uh, and the focus that's being put on strengthening the, the, I guess, the pipeline between K through 12 to community colleges, um, I think we do really need to straighten the community college to UC transfer task force as well. Um, I think from, um, sorry. I think just um, straightening that will really help us build more bridges between community colleges and UCs. Uh, particularly, and also CSUs, of course. Um, one of the, verse, the very first experiences that stood out to me as a prospective transfer student who was getting ready to go to Berkeley is that I didn't have the option to pay for for transfer students because there wasn't one. Um, I had to take a very standard generic tour that all the freshmen received. And it wasn't until then that I really realized how different my needs were as a transfer student from those of freshman students. And I had probably about 10 to 12 questions that my tour guide couldn't answer or didn't know where to direct me. So um, that can certainly be very discouraging for, for prospective transfer students. I also spent my entire two years at Berkeley with the transfer center closed um, and no real online services as a substitute. So um, that can definitely be also discouraging <coughs> for any student in my position. Um, and so I think that just really speaks to how much institutions like this and other larger schools aren't built for student transfers. And there's still a lot of work to do there. Um, and I think if we, we are talking about decreasing the time that students are spending in college and completing their bachelors, there has to be those bridges of support um, and mentorship. And we have to make sure those bridges aren't lost when the students transfer. Um, secondly, I think those bridges definitely, definitely need to extend to extracurricular groups. Uh, transfer students are severely limited in the clubs, orgs, and groups they can join, uh, despite how many, how these, despite the amount of, of clubs that are advertised, uh, just because they didn't have those two previous years of experience uh, that freshmen do to build connections and to find the groups that they fit into. Um, I actually had friends at Berkeley who didn't want to um, didn't want to say that they were transfer students because the moment that they do, 
um, they begin to be treated differently. They get less access to opportunities and they're excluded from a lot of groups. And I definitely experienced some of that backlash as well. So um, I feel like students shouldn't, uh, students should be able to say that they're proud to be transfers. We shouldn't have to hide it and, um, or say it out loud at risk at being excluded from certain opportunities. Um, so I think that's something that definitely, definitely I wanna see change. Um, as far as, I guess, what next steps look, uh, look like going forward, I think the more I think about it, I think counselors have such a big stake in this work um, because they're communicating this information. And um, I mean, I wish I could say I had better experiences with counselors, but there were a lot of times where I was misled about what courses I had to take. Um, there were resources that I didn't know existed because they weren't communicated to me and just a lot of those a lot of those kinds of experiences. Um, so I think this really goes goes back to creating a clear transfer pathway that not only gets students to a UC but also gets them to graduation. Yeah because there's some powerful improvements and really some really urgent ones that we need to think about in terms of our intersegmental collaboration, not just what it needs to share data, but how we think about intersegmental collaboration for the student experience. Um, but thank you, Catherine, for sharing that. And you know, I, sorry for what you went through, but I'm so glad to see you be successful. Again, I, um, can I just brag about some of the great work that you've done as a uh, a basic needs leader who's really, you know, been at every rally fighting for financial aid and, and total cost of success. Uh, you, you know, you've been so active in that. So thank you on behalf of students for what you've done. I want to ask you about um, the basic needs um, support that you believe that students need. Um, so tell us about your experience, um, what works, what could improve as well. Absolutely. So I I will be very blunt with this group. I have I have not faced basic needs firsthand personally, but I and I recognize what weight that statement brings. But even though I have not personally experienced it, I have heard the stories from each and every every student I could. The the system overall serves 1.8 to 2.1 million students overall, and out of all those students, someone is in need of basic needs whether they make it known right away from the get-go or they will eventually let you know later on in their journey. That cannot happen. We cannot allow that to keep happening. Um, the, re the only reason why basic needs became so much more prevalent in my three years of community college is because, well, the pandemic. The pandemic really put it into focus what basic needs meant to me. I didn't even know what basic needs was truly and really until I want to say April of 2020 when I became a senator for my college. And that's where they placed me on a task force and said, okay, you need to go and identify what the needs of our students are. And that's a big statement as in itself. And I'm a first year student, don't know what that means. And I barely have interactions with students. One story that I remember particularly standing out to me is the story of a mother. Um, she already had a, a child under, under the age of three and she was expecting another child within a matter of months. And it breaks my heart and it chokes me up every single time. So I'm going to attempt and try not to get choked up when I tell this story too, that she didn't have housing. She is on the brink of running out of her financial aid or whatever financial support that she had. And she also, was worried for her children because she could not get childcare for them. She had no family members to turn to. And it just, it ripped at my heart and it, and it broke me. And hearing her entire story, this was over a Zoom meeting too in the pandemic. And it was a three hour Zoom call too. And I will never forget ending that Zoom room. The, the thing that I did next, I called her and I said, I am so sorry that this is happening to you. I wish there was something I could do for you, but I honestly don't know what that could be. And that's what drove me to continue working in basic needs. When we look at basic needs, the, the definition in itself to students is, oh, food insecurity or housing. 
And when we look at those two topics, that's what generally a lot of people think that's what these fees are. That is not the case anymore. In the legislature, it says that there's a lot more. I won't go too in depth on that because that's what luckily um, Vice Chancellor O'Brien can do for all of us, or we can look at the legislature itself. But basic needs has expanded, especially with the COVID pandemic. It made it very clear and prevalent what students need and that those needs were basic needs. I won't name them all, but I'll name a few that have become more and more of a need because of the pandemic. Technological support and broadband accessibility for our students. Um, housing, under the scope of housing. I didn't know this, but there were three aspects of it. There's home, homelessness, housing insecurity, and housing instability. I don't know. I, I, I wish there was more that I could speak to that, but that's just one of them. Food insecurity, also medical and menstrual access for students, in addition to also child care. Those are just a few things out of many. I could talk about transportation as well. I could talk about also the need to address finan um, financial costs at college. Those, again, those are all things that the pandemic proved that students need now more than ever. There's also some unspoken things under the scope of basic needs that students don't talk about enough. I wish there, I wish I was a lot more braver to say that I needed, I needed mental health, but I also didn't know that mental health is now being considered and looked at as a basic need for our students in order for them to succeed. This system, as much as I will preach it, is the greatest system. I am proud to be a byproduct of it. I will never stop saying that because I myself. And the first in my family to go to community college. I'm proud to be, as controversial as this might sound, a first generation community college student in my family. The first and hopefully not the last person to have gone through this system. But at the same time, I hope that whoever next in my family will go through community college doesn't face whatever challenges that have been faced by our community college students, especially when it comes down to basic needs. But how is it that as great as our system is, and I'm sorry to take, take a little bit of a hot take and controversial shot at this, but how is it that we serve 1.8 to 2.1 million students across 116 colleges with the exception of Calvary across 73 districts throughout the entirety of the state and still not be able to address every single one of their needs? I don't understand how that is. I don't understand how that could be. Well, again, I do recognize my place of privilege in, in having been through the system and not having faced any of those burdens. I do, well, I, I do still think about the students who do face those burdens. If we could make debt-free college for a thing, I would love to see that happen. I hope that's not just something that stays a dream. If we could find a way to address housing, Please make it happen. I hope that's not going to be a dream because I know there are students that whatever the issue may be, if it was if if it was addressed, it would give them more of a reason to come to our campuses. We wouldn't have to. I mean, let me rephrase. There wouldn't be a stigma around community college as my as my former colleague had stated. Community colleges itself have been stigmatized for years. Let's make co community college a real college. Not saying that it's not already not by addressing what those needs are in, in basic needs. Doing that can really put a community college first on the mind of a high school student because I did not consider community college first because I thought, oh, I don't need community college and community college will not um, serve me in the ways that I want to be served or, or present me any opportunities or give me the resources I need to succeed. If we address basic needs, then we can, we can ensure that students will succeed at the forefront. I had the honor and pleasure um, during my time in the Student Center for California Community Colleges in serving as their representative to the Intersegmental Basic Needs Task Force. I got an opportunity to actually work with one of your col colleagues. I don't know if they're still here, but Vice Chancellor Marty Alvarado and I, oh, hey, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> um, we went back and forth about what students need. One of the first things I said is we need a definition for basic needs that students can understand. As little as that is, it means a lot to students because I, get, again, will admit, I did not know what basic needs were. I, and I'm glad to now know that I do know what it is, but a student coming in from the K through 12 system may not. So if they see that definition and they know what that is, maybe they will be more empowered in themselves to not be so shy about going, going to someone and asking for their needs. Our community colleges have food pantries, which is great. That is so incredibly great. When I went to Sac State and I asked about their food pantry, it took me an hour to find where their food pantry was. If I was on Sac State's campus, it would take them five minutes to show me where the food pantry is. That's why, again, I will always forever and say that the CCC is better. 
<laughs> but it's things like this, these little things like this under the scope of the topic at hand, basic needs that are so incredibly crucial to each and every one of our students. If we figured out a way to go and, and ensure that all of their needs were met by the time they set foot on our campuses, I, I will have done my job. I will, be, I will be happy to say I have done my job. Um, as for my recommendations to this group, because I believe that's probably the next thing you're going to ask, right, Vice Chancellor Navarrete? My, my recommendations are this, and let me know if they're a little bit ambitious or determined in asking, but I hope these are things that we can consider. First off, we need to re-identify the needs under the scope of basic needs for all of our student populations. I am emphasizing the term all because no two student groups are alike. Whatever the needs of our military population, for example, can different can vast differently from our disabled population versus an ethnic group on our campus. So just taking an example, our military population might need more housing or mental health services versus our disabled population who may need technological support versus what our African-American students may need and their needs, whatever they may be, are going to differ from those groups. That's just an example I'm going to put out there. Next is getting our campuses to offer low cost or free housing. I know that there is constant work on, on getting legislature to do so with the budgets, uh, with the, I'm sorry, the governor's budget that recently went out. We can, I do believe strongly we can make it happen. So hopefully as leaders and advocates of us students on the highest level, I hope this is something that can happen. Um, second of all, or I'm sorry, third of all, is ensuring that our students have housing because housing does play a crucial part into the student success. If there is no place at the end of the day uh, for a student that they can go to, to go and study, to relax, then they cannot succeed. I will be the first one to tell you that. I've stayed on campus for hours and I have had numerous breakdowns because I was so embarrassed and I just could not go home. But I also know that's probably not the best example because I know that there are more students who can speak better as to why housing means so much to them. The next thing is also reevaluating what the true cost of college is. There are so many factors when going to college that we do not, that we as community college students are not told, even if you're coming from the K through 12 system. I wish there was someone that took the time to sit down with me and tell me, okay, aside from your books and your college tuition, here's what else you'll need to keep in mind for pay. I talked to a student recently from Santa Monica College when I was in Los Angeles recently, and they told me that they wish they had someone who would tell them that the cost of units was going to be $60 in addition to a potential a meal plan that I didn't even know community colleges were going to start offering, or at least that one, in addition to also transportation costs to get to campuses. I know there are colleges that have great initiatives for that. I will take, for example, Irvine Valley College and Saddleback, who have the OC Transit Pass Initiative to ensure that, camp that students have free transportation to campus. And then not only that, I also hope that you can also look to truly preparing our students for the next step of their academic journey under the scope of basic needs. As my, again, my former colleague mentioned that intersegmental trans um, handoff is so incredibly important. I'm a student who went from the CC system into the CSU system. There was no warm handoff for me to know, okay, where can I find the basic needs center or where can I go to get resources for menstrual equity or I'm sorry, menstrual, <laughs> menstrual products or emergency contraceptives. Um, that's something that I hope can see that we can see for our students because if we're going if we're going to ensure that our students succeed, let's also ensure that they have a warm handoff going from one of our one of our colleges into wherever they be going next, whether that be a CSU, a UC, or a private institution, wherever it may be, it has to be there because I hope that. Um, those students are prepared to go into it. And as my colleague also said that CC students happen to just know it a little bit better. And then last but not least is still committing to students and ensuring that they are at the very forefront regardless of the matter. Basic needs is just a start of that. So those are my recommendations to not just the board, but also the chancellor's office. I hope those weren't too much of me to ask, but fingers crossed because I'm always in support of everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. I want to um, ask our last question to our, um, before turning it to the board, um, President Turbalon, um, you are, um, you know, you are an advocate for adult learners, and you've made a point at various meetings to highlight that you're, that our adult learners on campuses are really the new traditional. They are the, the, the hope for California, California's community colleges, that your needs matter. 
Can you um, tell us about, you know, as an adult learner, what can colleges do to help you, students like you, um, reach your educational goals, whether that's um, the degree, credential, certificate? So can you tell us your thoughts on that. Sure, thank you. Um, and, and some of these things have already been, been mentioned, um, such as, as we need affordable housing, uh, the expansion of basic uh, need centers on uh, being implemented on campuses, um, expand, expanded tutoring options, uh, more work in the OER section so that we can actually get to classes where we're getting free textbooks, um, more open communication between faculty and students, uh, because as um, uh, adult learners, uh, we may have uh, different um, circumstances than some uh, uh, faculty we may be used to. Um, we need expanded daycare center facilities. Um, it's often uh, students uh, are, are seeking, you know, childcare or, or for, during for their students, for their, I mean, excuse me, for their children while they're taking their courses. We need expansion of daycare facilities, uh, expansion of online options and hybrid courses, um, and basically more, more course options as a whole. Um, and then also as an adult learners being uh, flexible, flexible um, with um, accommodations in our learning journey, uh, whether it be in testing or, or uh, different uh, options and assignments. Um, as a veteran student, um, I definitely realize the, the importance of the, the veterans resource centers that are on campuses. Uh, and if there are any campuses that uh, are lacking a veteran resource centers or those that are uh, functioning, um, that they actually have those VRC centers. Um, and for those that are functioning, uh, more campus support to those VRC centers because they're integral um, as, a, as a veteran uh, transitions uh, into student life. And also it benefits um, uh, our dependents uh, that are able to use those programs, um, which oftentimes um, makes the life easier as a veteran, uh, knowing that your dependents are being taken care of on those campuses. Um, those would be some of the, the, the things that I would highlight uh, and also support in, of the new um, bachelor uh, degree com uh, completion program uh, that's underway. Uh, those would be some things that I, I would definitely uh, say that would help us as adult learners and actually as the students overall. Thank you. And thank you for making that final point, right? That these are strategies can collectively help our adult students, but also our campuses as a whole. I want to uh, open up to members of the Board of Governors to engage our students, see their questions that you might have, um, or anything about their student experience that you'd be interested in hearing about. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll start. Thank you both for being here, and thank you, too, for being available remotely, even if you can't be here with us, I feel as though you're right in this room. As you talk about your transition from the community college into the four-year pathway, was there any point in time when you weren't on that trajectory, where you were still trying to find what path you belonged on? Or did you enter the community college set on the ambition of transferring and knowing every step of the way how to reach that goal? Because for many of our community college students, what they arrive with us in terms of ideology of what their projection may be changes vastly as they're exposed to additional classmates, maybe a mentor that they come in contact with, potentially even just finding that there's a, a career opportunity that aligns with their interests. So I'm, I'm interested in where your journey began and how it developed over time. Um, I can start. I, um... I mean, I chose community college because I didn't have the financial resources to go anywhere else. I had committed to a state school, but then I think a month before it started, I ended up dropping out and coming to community college. Um, I actually also had a switch of major early on. So um, I used to be a journalism major when I started taking classes at Delta. Um, I realized pretty quickly that that was not where I wanted to be. So I switched into political science. Um, I mean, I think from then on, 
I think what, what kept me on that trajectory was just having the mentors that I really did. Um, just the level of community support with the college. Um, I found a lot of mentorship in my professors uh, who were heads of the department, the poli sci department, who I both regularly still talk to today. Um, and they continue to be my mentors after I transferred to Berkeley um, over the course of the two years. So I knew that I could still reach out to them if I needed something that I, or if I needed a question answered that I didn't have the answer to, um, they would help me find the answer to it. So I think that's kind of support, that level of support um, really kept me on this trajectory. And I think that's really what makes the difference for a student is when they find not only an area of interest or a passion that they have, but when they feel supported, supported in that area of passion, I think that's really what makes the difference and keeps them on the tra trajectory throughout their whole college journey. So I'll also add, add to that. So I, I went into the community college system not very well supported. I'm the daughter of two immigrants from the Philippines and they both have um, four-year degrees or the equivalent of four-year degrees or an actual four-year degree from the United States. Um, it was not supposed to happen that I went to community college. I actually was supposed to go to a four-year that had always been the game plan for me, but I ended up not doing so. I remember applying straight away out of high school. And the saddest part is I got rejected from every single college I applied to. And that was absolutely devastating. And I still have the list of all the colleges I applied to. <laughs> no, I still look at it to this day and realize, wow, that girl was so ambitious. I could not keep up with her. Um, and, I, and mind you, I applied both in state, out of state, and also out of country too. I'm still a little bit salty that the, um, a college in the Philippines just absolutely denied me. But that's okay, because what I realized yeah, what I realized is getting getting rejected by all those colleges brought me to the community college system. And I'm so glad that it did. When I first went into the system, again, in August of 2019, I did not go under pre-law like I have been telling everybody. So don't find this as a shock. I know um, our board president may not find this as a shock because she found this about me when we first met. But I actually came into the system as a theater major for performing arts. I went in not intending to go into pre-law, although I loved pre-law. I just didn't know that a community college could offer things for pre-law. That's why I chose um, theater. And also it's because it was something I was good at because I can cry on cue as need be. <laughs> <laughs> That's my secret superpower, everyone. <laughs> but uh, after taking several theater classes and whatnot, I remember we were talking about the crucible. I don't know what happened. I don't know why it was, but I remember just screaming at my professor and, and, and this is a healthy debate. So I wasn't mad at my professor, but she had said, Jen, why are you in my class when you know you should be a lawyer? And I'm like, I don't know. I know Abigail's guilty and I don't know why in your class. And I know I should be a law student, but I'm here. What do I do? And she dragged me out of the class and actually marched me over to the counselor's office and said, this girl needs to not be in this major, but actually as a poli sci or pre-law, whatever that is. And had it not been for that professor to recognize and realize that, I would have never gone into the two plus two plus three law pathway program, which absolutely changed my life and opened up so many doors for me. Through that, I actually am able to hopefully later this week, which I'm super excited for, now say that I will be going to a conference in New York with a bunch of legal students, even though I am not a legal stu law student myself um, just yet, but I'll be networking with them through the program because I heard about it through there. Not only that, I had a, another professor in my spring semester of that same term when we went into the pandemic, and I lost all hope to continue on with my journey. I wanted to drop out. I was crying every single night because there was like an unsurmountable amount of pressure that was going on. I didn't have family support. Again, I will continually state that. And not only that, uh, I'll bear my heart a little bit, but my family faced an unexpected amount of grief that no one could have expected because of the COVID pandemic. Again, that's a story that's not unheard of or untold, but it is my story. and. I was glad enough for that one professor to take the initiative to reach out to me and say, hi, I know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what your story is. I'm not going to ask or bug you or press you for answers, but I do 
believe in you. You're a bright light and I believe in you succeeding. And so we had a, what was intended to be a 30 minute Zoom call turned into a two hour Zoom call where I explained to him, I am falling apart. My heart is absolutely broken and I don't wanna do anything anymore. I don't wanna be here anymore. I don't wanna be in college anymore. I just wanna go home, stay at home and stay in a ball for the rest of my life. I don't care what happens. I just don't wanna do this anymore. And I don't have passions to be a lawyer anymore. And he said the words that absolutely changed my life forever. And he said, Jen, you were wrong. You are in the right place. You're just not in the right mindset right now. And I promise I will do whatever it takes to get you there. For him, he introduced me to Student Senate. Student Senate changed my life. I'm really close with the advisor. So shout out to Deborah Knowles. Um, through her, with the amount of challenges that came my way that I didn't expect how she helped me through that because she has a counseling background and she encouraged me to continue going on. In fact, she was, on, she was one of the very many people and in fact, the last person to convince me to run for student trustee for my very own district when I told her I didn't want to. If, if had it not been for her, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to work with our amazing board president Pam Haynes the way that I've been able to. And also through her as well, I wouldn't be able to have the opportunities of where I am now. Through her, I and my other professor too, shout out to Dr. Gaffney as well, can't forget about you. Um, I would not be sitting in this room, I would not be sharing my experience with you, and I would not be the student leader that I am today and not be able to say with my whole heart and chest with pride and this excited energy that I am a proud byproduct of the California Community College system as a first generation daughter of immigrants from the Philippines. So that is why I'm glad that this system, it's entirely changed my life. I hope that answered your question, but um, <laughs> that's, you did. that's where it is. You did. So I wanna thank all three of you for bringing the student voice to us today. Um, it is, um, it's really important because you're, you have an expertise that we may have had many years ago, but we do not have now because things have changed. Um, we um, want to make certain that you know um, that your voice is not just um, essential. It needs to be elevated in decision making. And I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues on, on this Board of Governors. We are going to be in partnership with you to ensure that your voice is at the table. So thank you so much. So with that, a five minute, a five minute break. I gave you six minutes. Okay, so we are we are very much on time. And again, thank you, students. We really appreciated your input. Um, and so, um, Chancellor Gonzalez um, and Executive Vice Chancellor Alvarado, um, we're going to go into Ready for the Future. All right. Okay, all right. So we're sensing our energy levels going down. So Marty and I were thinking we would go around and just one word that describes your current, uh, you know, mental state, how you're thinking about the future. That'll help us recalibrate. Just so you know, this is the time where you're going to do the most engaging. We're not going to put you into, into teams. We are going to facilitate this conversation, but it'll bring it all together. So you have the next an hour and 50 minutes to do that work. So just one word that describes um, how you're looking at the future today. So I'm looking at member Rawlings. I, I think uh, thinking about the future. You said one word, right? Just one word. Yeah. <laughs> Optimistic. Transitional. Expansion. I'm, I'm gonna pass and I'll be the last thing. Ready. Uh, energized. <clears throat> Listening. Uh, inspired. I couldn't hear you. Inspired. 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 Okay. Um, we have two online. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, 
Valerie, one word. Oh, can't hear you. That was more than one. <laughs> oh, I just walked in. I'm sorry. One word to it out. Out. So, so I don't know what the assignment is, but I'll say hopeful. Okay. Hopeful. Okay. 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 Good answer, Valerie. Good answer. Yeah. You guys are kidding me. <laughs> Valerie, I came up with that word because Rawlings took the first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of um, I would say um, inspired. I'm going to break the rule. Highly motivated. All right. All right. Well, Marty, what do you think? You better match this energy. Yeah, we better match this energy. Well, we're excited to facilitate you through the last set of. of um, the presentations today. This is your last panel, and then you're going to reflect with President Haynes. So in this panel, what we're hoping to do is really synthesize all of the conversations that you've heard today, bring you together to really focus on that evolution that needs to happen, and uh, really end with some near and long-term priorities for this board. And we've heard a number of them already, right? So what happens next? Where do we have the next conversation about the roadmap? Um, what does it look like to engage stakeholders? How should we have a focus group or more listening tour? So let's, that is where we're heading with this conversation. If I could ask the team to put up the slides again, the slides are really more guiding posts. A lot of these slides are going to look like the ones that you just saw, because now we're going to show you the slides interconnected uh, into where we're heading. So this conversation is ready for the future, the vision for success in an evolving landscape. So you started off the morning by hearing a little bit about the national context, the state context. You also heard who we serve, and then information about perceptions about higher education as a way of signaling how students around the nation feel about the, you know, the students that we currently don't serve. You also then heard directly from Ben Chida and Executive Vice Chancellor Navarrete on the big commitments, the big vision that the governor and the legislature have for this state. A lot of alignment, some opportunities where this vision can, can grow and evolve, to borrow uh, a word from board members. And now, as we head into this evening, you most recently heard from our students, successful students, and then students who are returning. So our student senate president, right, returning after taking a really big break after serving our country. And then thinking through what they recommended of what could change. So now it's time for us to really dig in and think about what is the role of the Board of Governors? How have you enabled those conditions for success for our students? And then where do we need to head next? So let me just quickly summarize what I heard from the students. I heard the students loud and clear on this board's commitment to being student-centered and what it meant for them to be a part of, but engage in, in their community. And then at the statewide level, especially for Catherine, what it meant to engage in DIA work and how it transformed her own campus, her own mindset as a leader, right? To the extent that it then helped her say, hey, I think I wanna be a Senate fellow. I wanna help the state design good policies. And that's really impressive. I heard our student Senate president say that when we do this work, we need students at the table, and he's absolutely right. And all of our students, I think, talked about the connections, the direct pipelines, whether it was from community colleges to UC and CSU to workforce or being serving this country back to their campus. Those are all guided pathways, right? Direct pipelines. You heard them say and use the word pipeline multiple times. But in order to do that, every single one of these students talked about streamlined resources. And we heard that a lot from our own students on this board. What does it mean to have holistic solutions? We don't just build siloed solutions. So I heard that loud and clear that this is about streamlined resources, meeting their basic needs. You heard that loud and clear, mental health, housing. But more importantly, how is it all connected? Right, going back to President Haynes' comment about, you know, we shouldn't just meet that one lucky person, right? Although we all have that story as a part of our journey. And then I think for me, really important and a great question for our student Senate president 
hearing directly about what our adult learners need, right? We get, keep getting this, why are students, uh, you know, the ones that we're losing and the ones that we're not serving, why are they not coming to our campuses? And very powerful from him to say, we want you to communicate with us differently. That was really powerful. We want you to then do a lot of high touch counseling. Show us where we need to go. Show us what classes we need to take and why. Give us childcare and daycare. That is really important to us. And online and hybrid courses. He wasn't selling us on whether we should have brick and mortar classes, right? He was saying, we want innovation and flexibility when we want it, right? When, when the education meets our needs. And then I heard from him as well, the connection between if we want our students to succeed, it doesn't matter if they're CTE students or students seeking to transfer or seeking an associate's degree, they want clear pathways. And I heard loud and clear from him how baccalaureate degree programs were just as important for all students. And that was a really powerful ending. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And the next slide we wanted to do here is really remind you of the change that is ahead. You know that, you feel that as a board. And I hope that today's meeting is signaling that to all of you as well. Because I can tell you that my two phones have been going off and the field sees that from this board and they are excited. We like to start with the quote. This is Marty's doing, actually. We love quotes here. <laughs> Change is inevitable, but growth is intentional. You are in a moment of growth. Both the vision needs to grow, and you all as a board are also growing. And that means that we as staff supporting your work are then also growing. What is important to note here is, you know, I have heard President Haynes talk in different spaces, and I have always heard her say this. The vision for success has a long way to go, but it is showing us that we are heading in the right direction. And you saw that with the not necessarily in clear ways, some of the data points. But if you if you recall one of John Hetz's slides that showed you transfer level math and English in year one, that was really impressive growth in a short amount of time. Right? Yeah. But going back to, but we can always do more. And that's the intentional growth that we all need to do together. So that's where we're hoping to take you next. Next slide. So this is where you are as a board and as a system. This is where we are. You launched the vision for success in 2017. Most of you were here, some of you, uh, and some of our board members were not. But you have also been touched by the vision for success on your own campuses. And that is incredible. For good or bad, the vision for success impacted all of our colleges and asked us to do more, all of us, not just the chancellor's office, not, not just you as a board. 2018 was really a big year right before everything started to get crazy, but 2018 was really the year of legislative reforms and system investments. It was the year that you saw the student center funding formula, a big investment on guided pathways, AB 705, you started to see pilots and seating for competency-based competency education, credit for prior learning. That was all that year because this board recognized that one of the ways to get there and more importantly, that your role as a board was structural transformation. So you needed to change the structure. But in order to do that and to have the right incentives, you then needed to go and change laws and you needed to change fiscal policies and now we're in the space where we are, again, going back to the drawing board, thinking of strategies, and then thinking about the intentional strategies that will take the implementation to the next level. As you all know, 2019, 2020 hit, and we all know what happened then. But you saw that specific uh, year was really academic year, was about student equity, it was also about a pandemic, it was also about a call to action because we realized that the world around us was changing and that we needed to evolve as a society, first of all, then as a system, and then as a family. And I really believe that's where we still are. We are growing as a society. Yes, we are still in a pandemic. Yes, there are multiple crises, but where we are today 
is really how we evolve together as a family, as a system. 2021 was a really big year for this board, right? Not only were you trying to navigate what it meant to be in a pandemic and seeing that not many things were changing, but 2021 was your year of virtual meetings. It was also your year where you were incentivizing innovation and you allowed and gave permission for the chancellor to take on a role under emergency conditions to, for lack of a better word, break a lot of things, right? You allowed emergency conditions. I heard earlier today, Member Grande say, why are we even giving options? Everyone should get an excuse withdrawal. We should be doing everything to help our students. That was that phase of the work regulatory action, student basic needs, and rallying the troops so that we can have one voice across the street and at the federal level. I'll remind you that 2021 was also the year that the federal government was debating Pell Grant, how they would calculate even emergency funds where they would negatively impact our colleges. There were a lot of folks that rallied with us to tell the story of our students and you all were at the forefront of that work. So now we're in 2022, our landscape continues to change. And guess what? It's going to continue to change. You have a really big year, it's an election year. One third of the legislature will be new as of January of this year. You also have a potential lingering recession. And you heard a lot yesterday from our new Department of Finance Director, Joe Stephenshaw. And one of the things that he said that caught my eye, and I hope it caught your eye, what he said, in a moment of crisis, when we are cutting things, we are going to look to see what promises we made. And to me, that's really important. That's that multi-year roadmap. That's what we're being held accountable to, right? To align to and to meet. So 2022 is a year of regulatory action. I'll tell you that when this pandemic started, Marty has the numbers and the list, but you passed 22 regulatory actions since the pandemic started. Those were structural transformations, and it's going to take a lot more if you're gonna meet the roadmap for the future. Because in some ways we are ready, and as you all identified, in some ways we are not ready. And so we're going to need to get ready and with urgency. Next slide. So these are your tools and we love this graphic. <laughs> Marty and I love this graphic because it's a little bit of a precision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what you would use. <laughs> <laughs> to crack the egg. Um, but these are your tools as a board, right? We talk about goals. We talk about commitments, strategies. These are your tools. This is what this board has primarily used in the past. And I, I want to preface that what this board has primarily used in the past, because we are in a transition, right? We are growing and learning, but budget advocacy has been critical. Your legislative advocacy, the regulatory actions. And as you know, that's a lengthy process. Some of you have been at the front end and it, it could take up to six months to two years, right? Regulatory actions. And that is done in partnership with all of our stakeholders and the consultation council resolutions. If you recall, it wasn't too long before the vision for success that this board, this system started to recognize undocumented student week of action or just undocumented students in general. That was this board through your resolutions. And now we do it annually. It's coming up in October, by the way. You also had learning sessions, learning sessions that really kind of set a stake on the ground for colleges and districts of where we were going to head next. Those are the learning sessions when, if you recall, um, Lasana Hotep, Potty Equity, where this board started, you also started to hear about the social determinants of success for our students. And in those same meetings, you heard our team talk about vision for success destinations as the future of implementation, right? We would need a new way to help the system understand their role. Another key strategy and, and tool that you have are your partnerships and your influence. So it makes me very happy to hear you say those words and to say that that's one of the things that you wanna lean on it as we head into 2023. And then transformational leadership modeling. You've done that through your trustee fellowship. We are learning, we continue to grow that fellowship, but also in the team that you have assembled. 
And we're very proud of this team. So thank you for supporting the team. And then in centering students, that's something that you all have already identified in all of the responses to your survey. But these are the tools in many ways um, that will always be important. But where we wanna take you is, so what's next? Because this can't be it. Our education code is actually very permissive. And so we wanna walk you through some of the opportunities ahead if we're going to meet the 70% post-secondary education credentials by the year 2030. So next slide. Here's what we heard from you today, and we've been pivoting and making changes behind the scenes. I hope you didn't see any of that. But your, our impact today, we saw that in some of your responses, right? We deliberately centered students. You have shared that the vision really set really clear goals, a clear direction, that it has improved student outcomes, and that it has created big shifts, culture shifts. But there are a number of key opportunities ahead that we wanted to highlight for you. There's an increased focus on addressing equity and opportunity gaps. I think all of you have said that today, right? We need to do more. Not only do we need to understand where they are, and we don't just mean regionally, right? But we need to lean in and really focus on those. Improving our structures to shorten time to completion. All of you have said that today as well. And luckily it's also a part of your roadmap and our students shared that as well. And then strengthening clarity for transfer and outcomes. Those three things stood out for us because they're really at the heart of what our students say they need and at the heart of the vision. So as you think about transforming, that's one of the things that I think will always stay close at the heart of whatever you design next, wherever we head next. So next slide. I wanna pause here and just um, see if there are any questions. Yeah. So um, I keep on looking at that 70% and I keep on looking at the 2030, which is about seven years away. And I, I need to have an idea of, of what that differential is between now and then in terms of expectation. Absolutely. Yes. Because it's going from 13% to 70, right? No, 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 no. no. no it hasn't been that. Showed us, <laughs> and what he showed us earlier, completion rate was... John, so do you want to come up? Come on down. Yes, so um, this is the overall goal for the entire state of California, uh, not just the goal for our system. Oh, okay. right. I was, so this, he was saying it, I was like, okay. Is, part of a national plan yes. to get more students, more, more working age adults, the credentials that they need to be able to be successful. Um, so this is 70% for working age Californians, not 70% of the students. But since we serve a very large proportion of Californians, yeah. in order to achieve this, we are going to have to step up our game. Can what, you do what is our baseline? Where are we currently? That's that was my question. Thank you so much. I was about to look that up. <laughs> oh. You called me up. Um, like, do you remember what it is? I think it's like it's in the like fifties. Oh, okay. It, yeah. But it's a long. It's an incredibly ambitious, um, ambitious agenda. <laughs> we have millions to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got like twenty percent to go. We can do that. <laughs> I love your optimism. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I think it's something to keep in mind here also is that hence the roadmap, right? The roadmap is our guide for our piece of this, right? How do we make sure that we're continually calibrating that as we go? Um, but I think that is, you know, in service of meeting this goal. So I don't want us to get, you know, is this a new goal? A no, it's not a new goal. Yeah. No. Statewide. And then we have our roadmap that is, is heading us in this direction in aggregate uh, with the governor's office. But you're right, we do need to get clear, right? Do, what is do. the baseline? Yeah. What are our annual then internal goals? And then how do we share that with our colleges and our districts? Yeah. yeah. Because we've asked them to align to the vision for success. So I'll just quickly remind you as a part of your journey of implementing many of these transformations, we ask our districts to align to the vision for success and to set their local goals. Now, have we ensured that? Has yeah. there been a system check? Is there that alignment with 
Um, his strengths in chess. Yeah. Oh, yep. Sorry. Um. So yes, and. Right. Uh, so we did have uh, vision, uh, we did have districts set local vision goals. Uh, we are cal recalibrating that, and um, as part of what you all have heard previously around streamlined reporting, trying to uh, shift our reporting structure so that colleges are regular re regularly reporting outcomes across efforts, programs, investments, work streams in alignment with how those investments are impacting vision goals. And so that is a work in progress. There is a 15 college pilot in, in progress. And then we anticipate we're right now working on how do we roll that out system wide. Um, so yes, yes and. What's, what's the proof point? Like, how do you prove it? Like, because I know we, we, are, we affirm the vision for success, but then when we do our strategic plan, the language is not like it's an line for line, it's yeah. like it's the alignment. goals that you that he showed earlier, like those were really good, like very specific goals. And then we kind of fall, it's just weird. Like, so how do you prove that the district is um, adopting what the vision for success is? So what we will be doing going forward, again, in a, in a 15 college pilot right now, which your district is part of, yeah. um, but moving forward, it will be a system-wide requirement that for investments in programs right now, roughly, I wanna say 14 different programs, EOPS, DSPS, aspects of strong workforce, et cetera, all of the required annual reporting is in alignment with those metrics. So what they are reporting on for each of those programs is how they are moving the needle on the vision goal metrics. So it, it will be a state requirement that that is what they are submitting to us uh, every year. So that's what's moving forward. So I'm I'm really interested in. Did you have a follow up? I well I could just wait. I'll ask offline because because I feel like that's the requirement now, right? It is. Uh, it, it is not. No, it's not. So every program right now has their reporting own. requirements. Yeah. They are not all in alignment with the vision goals. What okay. we are doing is bringing all of those into alignment with the vision goals. Okay, so that's probably why it's missing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that was a really good question and it, it sets mine up. So. Um, is is there no not district i'm thinking i'm thinking more regionally okay and i'm thinking about the central valley um low uh, uh, employment rates low educational rates but over the as a result of um all of the the uh, either initiatives programs and the vision for success they have a uh, they have a coalition of k12 the the uc and 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 they've been doing this and so would it be fair to say that um, because of that coalition of the of, of the group that they are more aligned or with with regard to where they're going? Um, I'm trying to think of is there some, is, is there an entity within the, the state of community colleges that we could look at in terms of some of the best practices of getting where we need to go um, without their but without. You know, they they're sort of did it on their own without the mandate to do it. I, I think or there are definitely bright spots, right? Um, that we can we can continue to bring forward. We try to bring several of those forward in our system webinars and in some of the uh, other webinars and uh, efforts and conferences across the system. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes. There are bright spots of where action is happening and where. Um, you know, I love that quote, chance favors the prepared mind for communities like Central Valley, uh, Inland Empire and others where there has been disproportionate impact in those communities. Yeah. They have really mobilized in ways that are helping them to be ready for the changes that are happening. And as we heard when um, uh, Member Williams uh, district came and presented on streamlined reporting, they are maximizing the opportunities to engage in the new practices. So, and I see that happening in a lot of different places, uh, a lot of different colleges. So we can continue to bring those forward and spotlight them in your uh, in your regular uh, board meeting spot. That, that would really be helpful. Thank you. But I hear also um, in many of your comments, how are we preparing to actually implement and provide direction to the system, which is your primary role mm -hmm. as a board, mm -hmm. right? And then underneath that, I also hear sort of the uh, the competing principles of we have independent districts, right? So how do we make sure, how do we have oversight and accountability? 
And unfortunately, it's very messy, but that's exactly where our presentation is heading next, by the way. Mm -hmm. But what I want to share with you is just four things that I, I want to make sure that you caught, because as we were hearing this presentation, there were really four things on the vision for success, and there are probably two more that we need to track and really think and discuss as a board, all of you, right? What does this mean for the vision for success in the system? The first is your goal on average unit, right? This is the time to completion. The roadmap does set a higher goal. So you, for you as a board to consider, what does that mean? Is 60, when we know that the average is 87, right? Where do we want to be? Where does the Board of Governors want to ask the system to be? The second one is transfer. Very clear goals. You all as a board have a UC CSU goal. The roadmap has very aggressive timelines and very aggressive transfer to UC and CSU. And at the same time as a board, you have not just been talking about transfer, you've been talking about equitable transfer. And so understanding where our students are transferring, thank you member Elizondo for advocating for public universities in this state. You all as a board have already kind of been discussing, do we expand that specific goal? And what does it mean? And so now this roadmap presents you with a discussion that you need to have as a board. The third one is there is a heavy, heavy interest in dual enrollment. So as a board, you need to decide, is this separate? Is it a goal? Is it a commitment? Or is it a strategy? Yes, a and strategy. is it a strategy for what, right? Is it a strategy for completion, yeah. right? So then, great. So that's the third thing. The fourth one is, it says very clear goals to increase living wage outcomes, much higher than the one that you all have. In addition to that, if there was a fifth one, it's the timelines, right? Your vision for success is set on timelines for 2022, summer 2024. This one sets a very clear kind of line in the sand, 2027, 2030, right? Depending on what we're looking at. So again, you all as a board, if we're going to provide clarity, which is your number one job and direction for this system, need to have that conversation about timelines. So I can tell you in this, in this moment, that is, I think, the top priority. The budget was just signed at the end of June. It is now August. It's a part of why we wanted to convene all of you, make sure that you understood the roadmap and this very uh, important and bold, courageous goal. But we need to start thinking about the next phase of implementation. And it starts with getting clarity on the tools that the board has and the direction that you want to give this system. So Marty, I'm going to actually hand it over to you to take us to the competing principles. So if we could just go to the slide on competing principles, please. Yep. So what we wanted to highlight here as we get into discussion around the board's role is really highlight some of the tension that you all have experienced uh, as you have advanced 22 different regulatory changes over the past uh, three years or so. Uh, it's substantial. It is substantial, it is impactful. It will take time to fully realize across the system, uh, but it is uh, a legacy. Uh, what I wanna highlight, or what is highlighted for you, I should say on the board is really the, this tension that you hear surface from the field at times which is that the Board of Governors shall provide leadership and direction and general supervision, which you have done through your regulatory action, through 11 resolutions, uh, through setting lots of enabling conditions for our system, but also you have the responsibility to maintain to the maximum degree permissible local authority and local control. Mm -hmm. right? um, and this goes back to the accountability. How are, we, how are we creating those feedback loops between the actions and the intent of the board and the actions and intent of local districts and campuses. And that is something that this board will have to continue to hold as we go forward and make explicit what is our role and where we take action to enact the impact that we are trying to have and how do we engage stakeholders in ensuring that they are um, appropriately responding and holding their accountability as well. Because uh, we like to say, at least I'll say, I like to say, uh, local authority and, and local control is really about local responsibility, right? They have a responsibility to meet the minimum conditions, minimum standards set by this board and by the state. Next slide, please. Uh, what we also wanted to highlight is the complexity and the uh, dynamic intersectionality 
of the board's relationships to various stakeholders. And this is another critical one. The local uh, districts and colleges have their dynamic relationship uh, schema, communities, local stakeholders, uh, employers, et cetera. As a board, you have relationships and hold accountability to the colleges and districts, but also to system stakeholders, right? Uh, to employers and businesses and communities, just like they do, to the legislature and state departments. The 70 goal, 70% 70 goal is a state goal that this board has to own and hold as well, in addition to what they do with colleges and districts, et cetera. And then you have a dynamic interplaying relationship with the chancellor's office who you direct to enact your uh, actions, right? And so it's important for this board to fully embrace that, that you have a, a multitude of stakeholders that you have to engage with, hold priorities for and interact with as you go forward and being able to communicate that effectively with stakeholders and as you take action is a critical component. Next slide, please. Um, what we wanted to highlight for you and remind you before we jumped into conversation is then what is the function of the board? Right? Uh, or what are the multiple functions, I should say, of the board? Um, and some of these surfaced in the conversations earlier today, things like the research and data, commissioning annual reports, uh, establishing priorities for system-wide research, uh, the advocacy and representation with legislature and Congress, uh, state support and system budgets, uh, minimum conditions, uh, minimum standards at the top there, coordinating interdistrict programs, uh, facilities and services, uh, really ensuring that those get mobilized effectively in alignment with state budget priorities, and then facilitation of articulation with the other segments, really leading across segments as we've talked about previously. I'm going to go through these quickly just to keep us moving, but really my hope is that you're taking away the breadth, but also the specificity of your role. All right, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, uh, to the earlier comments, review and approve comprehensive plans, educational programs, exercise general supervision over the formation of new districts, accounting structures for districts, uh, inter-district attendance policies, et cetera, et cetera. What I want to highlight here is that you have a role as a board to play in this. You set the structures for it and the expectations and where it is in alignment with the vision and where it is not, it is our job, your job to make those decisions and determinations and adapt, All right? So I, I wanted to call these pieces out because sometimes this can feel in the weeds and yet it's not what they do on a campus, it is setting those conditions and parameters for campuses so that they have the they have clear expectations as they are moving forward. Next slide, please. And then this last slide, we wanted to make sure we highlighted this, that you do have the full authority as you have exercised over the past three years to adopt rules and regulations necessary and proper to execute the functions specified. Okay. Uh, it is expressly authorized by statute to regulate, right? Those areas that you are uh, expressly authorized by statute to regulate. You have a clear role in leading the system and we have appreciated your courageous leadership up to this point. And we wanna encourage you to hold that in your mind as we go forward into this next discussion. Next slide, please. All right, uh, I just have to call out, I love this picture. Uh, I believe this is from our Riverside campus graduation. Uh, I think it is joyful and hopeful. And as we are thinking about the evolution of the vision for success, this, these are the moments that we are trying to lean into as we go forward. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanna call out, um, I heard in the 70% slide when we were having that discussion just a moment ago, um, a little bit of angst and urgency uh, that surfaced, um, maybe at least from a few of us. That's a good space to hold on to. It creates a good sort of tension that we need to be leaning into. And so we wanted to just recalibrate what you heard, what we heard earlier today. I'll say what I heard earlier today as we talked about the roadmap was that we really want to prioritize. Uh, we need to make sure we're prioritizing and valuing students' time, student choice, and, their, and the capacity they regularly exercise to make bold decisions about their education and career trajectory. I am repeating back to you what we heard in that conversation earlier today, that ultimately this is about establishing an intentional focus, the roadmap, the vision for success, the recalibration. It's also about making explicit to the field and to stakeholders the shared intent 
of the vision and the roadmap. We talked a lot about marketing and messaging and what we need to be doing as we go forward. All right, um, I'm gonna keep us moving. Next slide, please. Those are three critical components in that messaging. What we also heard in that data presentation from you all, right, from you all, um, was that we really needed to ensure that we have the right kind of data as we are going forward. I also heard a lot of, uh, we want more and more and more data. And so I'm gonna lean to sort of a tagline that we have uh, as part of our Guided Pathways Equity Agenda, which is learn, act, change. We can only consume so much information. And so as we consume information, we need to take just enough, learn from it, act on it, change before we start asking for more and refilling our plate, if you will. And so again, when we think about the prior slide where we talked about focus, intentional focus, making sure that we are not um, going down rabbit holes that we don't have the capacity to fully engage in, but really thinking about that angst and urgency that we experienced earlier to, to really hone in on where are there are some opportunities for shifting. What I also wanted to emphasize here is, are those earlier slides that Executive Vice Chancellor Hetz noted around what we do know about what students need. So in those slides, 57% of students said that their perceived challenge was cost. 57%, more than half. Half of them said life balance. Right? That is their perceived challenge. 40% stress and anxiety. These are probably not mutually exclusive. It's probably the same 50% in the same 40%, or at least a nice overlap of those, right? And then 39% fear of failure. These are all things we can mobilize around right now as we think about the strategies we deploy to advance the vision. The other thing that was noted was uh, what is influencing their enrollment? Again, on those slides that were shared, 56% said they needed flexible schedules, more than half. Flexible. They didn't say I want in person. They didn't say online. It is some combination of those. They need flexibility. They need they need someone to meet them where they are at the moment that they are in. Um, Fifty four percent. They needed credit for prior learning. They want what they have done to be valued. Right. We can do this. Fifty one percent said financial aid, and forty one percent said work based learning, and forty percent said confidence in career advancement. Right? These are all things that the students are telling us. They're in those surveys. We can use that information right now to mobilize. Next slide, please. And then lastly, last two slides, I believe, uh, just a reminder about where we have communicated to this board previously where we are headed. That part of the vision destination and part of helping our stakeholders and our system and ourselves understand what is our role in advancing the vision is really understanding where we are trying to mobilize for student impact. Again, I wanna say a thank you to Member Williams for um, challenging us once upon a time, asking where is our chief student experience officers? Uh, and we are trying to figure out how we take that lens and make it our destination. Our goal here is to empower learners, facilitate career mobility, and generate unconditional belonging. Next slide, please. Do everything that we do. And then lastly, uh, a few of the opportunities ahead in, uh, in the year ahead that were noted previously that we're leaning into. Again, I think really resonates with the data that we just highlighted from the students and that was highlighted earlier, adaptable learning constructs and modalities, the field, uh, academic senate, statewide academic senate and other uh, campuses are leading this effort, uh, creating those enabling conditions that improve those social determinants, creating universal access to employment experiences, which we began that journey with the work basic, uh, work cooperative work experience, now just work experience, excuse me, <laughs> uh, remembering the right language, work experience regulatory actions that you just took at your last board meeting, all of the work around DEIA affirming campus and classroom climates, and then really creating those networks uh, that will support students as they mobilize and go forward. All right, so that was the recap both from today and from previously. Now we wanna hear from all of you. Next slide, please. Given all of that, given that context, given what students need, given what you've talked about, given the data, given the leaning into the vision destinations, take a minute and if we were successful, 
at fully implementing the vision for success, what structures would need to change? What would need to change? Take a minute to write a few notes. I wanna give you a minute to think about this and then we will um, begin to share out. And then how would these structural changes position us to, to contribute effectively to that 70% state degree attainment goal? It looks like some folks are wrapping up with their thoughts, given cost, life balance, stress, financial aid, credit for credit, all the things our students are asking for. Uh, anyone uh, want to jump in on these questions? Go ahead, Member Raleigh. So I think um, being a little bold with it, uh, if, if we were to fully implement the vision for success uh, to achieve that, one of the things that we need to change is the power structures on campus. Mm. It's uh, we <laughs> right, that, that's out there, right? Okay. So the, the idea being uh, because they're well entrenched, right? Um, and it, it might not be uh, completely changing who is involved in this, city, but what is their mindset, right? If uh, myself coming from a labor background, right? As a labor leader, I need. Uh, my organization and the members of my organization to be radically student centered and to put the students at the center of what they get to design while being inclusive of the student voice at the table as they do it. Right. And that kind of radical inclusivity of that student voice and in that design uh, itself is a shift in the power structure. I, I think that's a major piece. I love it. Thank you. So can I build on that? Absolutely. Um, because I, I, we've we've talked about um, um, breaking down silos, mm. and that indeed we still have on our campuses silos. Yes. And um, and the, and there are rules that can be changed um, if it's not working. So, for example. Um, why is it that um, there are certain committees that are on campus that have never had a student voice? Uh, what what is what is what is stopping that that piece of it? Um, why is that? Okay, let me let me frame it as a question. Is there a need to have um, the academic senate meet, the classified senate meet, also kind of separately? Is are there not um, avenues for the the co mingling of our, our, our what what we do on campus in a way that we're it's inclusive of all of the voices um, and and what would it take to move in that direction? Not just what um, how long <laughs> and as as Martin said, not long, but it it takes us a long time to make changes, can we make them in a way that are, is time sensitive? Yeah. And can we, and really, can we, can we do that on behalf of the whole? Yeah, there's a level of trust that that requires. Mm -hmm. And commitment <laughs> yeah. to, to the whole. Yeah. Are you able to bring your slides back up? Yeah. Here's one where you had the circles and um, mm -hmm. you had some structures up there. You can pull up this slide deck. Yes, thank you. But I was just thinking about the sales funnel, um, like, because uh, 
Yeah, always it's all the way back, 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 back. It's like they had there were circles. That's all I remember was the circles. Oh, the <laughs> dynamics, the complex dynamics. Uh, the it was after that. Yeah, the relationships. Yeah. yeah. If we can go to the that um, structure. Back no, a few more one. slides. Yeah. That there. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So here we are. I, you know, again, I, I guess I'm biased because of the role, but if we don't build trustee capacity, and um, because trustees got to step up and start fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities, be you know, um, my experience. I'm just talking about my experience with uh, my colleagues in California. Um, we're kind of passive to a certain extent about the role and what. You know, because um, state law says one thing about what trustees can do, but they don't necessarily exercise their um, what they can do. And so if you can get if we can get trustees to buy into this, I think we can move districts along a bit faster. And so I think the chancellor's office really needs to, um, we can't rely on um, and no disrespect to CCLC. Um, we can't rely on an outside entity that we have no control over to do that piece for us. Like the Board of Governors should engage directly with trustees, in my opinion. But that's what we're doing. I mean, just with with regard to the the um the, the leadership, it's only what 12 to 15. You mean in the league? No, no, no. Oh. I'm talking about the foundation. The um, trustee fellowship. The fellowship. Yeah. That's yeah. what that that's yeah. really sort of the pilot yeah. for really getting us to talk about as trustees what our role truly is. Yeah. And it and and to use the power invested within that. Yeah. To really shape and make and make change. Yeah. So, so. I, I would put it on there either, mm -hmm. I, either under legislative, like they're part of the legislative body that you need, because mm -hmm. it's not just about engaging, engaging the legislator, but trustees like local control. They, um, but then the other part is um, the communications on this is the part that I'm most concerned about. Because even in this presentation, you see the roadmap to the future and then you see the vision for success what we're calling this and how we message it to districts, I just would hate to get our folks overwhelmed or confused or, okay. you know, um, we don't cascade messages well. And we really, if we nail it, then it's gonna be great. But if we don't nail the communications, I'm telling you, folks are gonna be confused, tired, overwhelmed, and then they'll create silos. And then somebody will be like, oh, okay, the mat roadmap for the future is this new program. And then next thing you know, somebody's going to build a building for it. And then it'll be <laughs> the roadmap room for, and we, that's not like what we're trying to do. Like, and it's because of the way stuff gets messaged to the districts. And then you do this in a rush and, and you know, cause in then there should be my opinion, one author of the documents, because when people are copying and pasting stuff together and making stuff that align fit and they don't really rewrite it from scratch it doesn't can come off like how you're thinking is coming off and then it just you know um, we see it with guided pathways i mean people thought guided pathways was a program and it just is not coming off properly and so the messaging i would change our like and no disrespect to people that are doing work but how our communications is that structure would be so we are being recorded so let me just pause and close course correct uh, yeah. in case yeah, anyone yeah. is confused out there so like many of our programs that have been created through the state legislature and the federal government this board kind of inherits right the resources the programming the policy and then we do have to deploy yeah so i just want to make sure that the field and, and this board understands the budget passed in june 30th right mm -hmm. you were always meant to have a retreat mm -hmm. and now you have a new document that is asking you to be bolder you heard directly from Ben Cheetah today. We don't care what you call it, he said, mm -hmm. end quote. Where this board needs to head next, and I agree with you, the communications is gonna be critical. You as a board have asked an entire system to implement the vision for success, mm -hmm. period. There is a lot of alignment with the roadmap to the future. And so now as a board, a great opportunity at your September board meeting to say, are we updating our goals? If so, to what? And then how do we begin to message to the system? Because the resources are aligned this year to the vision for success. But you have a multi-year commitment, an incredible opportunity. And that means that the next five years, 
need to now align to what the legislature will be investing in. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say that also does not preclude us from being bolder in other areas and identifying where there are other goals we'd exactly. like to reach in addition to what the legislature and the governor have recommended and directed us for. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Time to be bold. And intentional with the messaging. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is that loud yeah. and clear? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I would um I agree with everything that's been said. Um and I mentioned the online education earlier, and I think that's a big part of I don't I don't need to beat beat that horse any further, but um really that falls under technology. And I think if we're looking at how do we transform the system and move forward, we need to look at a radical change in technology and how we operate our system. That's including a system-wide transcript, common course numbering, de a degree auditing system that not only audits a student's courses and transcript for the degree that they've declared, but any degree that's in the system and it tells them, well, you're two courses away. This is the course you need to take. These are the offerings. Being able to seamlessly guide a student through the use of technology in the system is going to be important to be able to, for those completion rates, I believe. Because, not unfortunately, but we do have a lot of students in our system. And unfortunately, we have not as many hands and people to touch points with them at along the way. And technology will be that gap bridger between that, and I believe. So if we don't have that technology, those are the students really we're losing. Thank you. So I want to just because you make such a, a, a an important um, point as we start to look at um, how we're going to outreach to um, to bring our enrollment numbers up. One of the things if, if we need to use technology in a much more um, um, front facing way, and that is we should be able to call our students that we've had, identify through through an app, how many units they took all throughout there, and then and identify potentially where are they closest in terms of a certificate or a, a, an associate degree or, and then be able to contact them and say, well, you know, you were an anthropology major, but you've got X number of units here, and all you need are two classes, three classes, or in order to get an associate's degree. And, and for many of them, that will actually be enough yeah. because it's the degree, not, not necessarily what it's in, um, in, in moving it, uh, along in their career sometimes. And so um, it, it's that kind of use of technology that makes it a benefit for the, the, the students who, um, and many students don't know they're that close to a degree. Yeah, yeah, They've yeah. left for whatever reasons, mm -hmm. not looking back um, and, and just not, not knowing. Yeah. It's the promise of that future that brings them back That's or into right. the loop. And for me, you know, I don't know how many know, I have 13 associate's degrees. So a master at being able to cross-reference classes and being able to do that. And I've helped many students at Santa Monica College and even other institutions look at their transcripts and learn that they actually either already fulfilled the requirements of a degree that they didn't know, <laughs> mm -hmm. or they are one class away and they've changed their map to be able to take that class before transferring. And now they have two degrees instead of one or three instead of one. So some sort of technology system that is able to do that versus having students like me try to help other students, which should always happen as well, but it's, it's necessary. You made me think about on the one chart where you had the um, legislator and the, I think we really need to consider mayors and um, board of supervisors because they, they have a vested interest in um, having people increase their education levels because, you know, they can play a role or use their marketing dollars or, you know, find ways to help get information out to people with some college to go back. You know, that that's how their economic development dollars get Get, come into their area, especially from a retail standpoint, um, if more people go back and, and can complete their education. So engaging them would be, I think, a structural change that I think we need to think about. So um, board member Rawlings said something earlier that really stuck with me, and it was the 
realization that YouTube is our competitor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So many, many. Yeah. <laughs> that that really translate to me, translates to me as a need to be nimble, which I know mm -hmm. is, is really difficult to understand in, in a systems based um, structure. But the value proposition, we keep talking about bringing students back to campus, but why? So we need to really clearly lean into what that value proposition looks like because I, I don't have a good grasp on it right now. And if we're planning on sticking to very traditional models when YouTube is our competitor, we are being grossly reactive and not proactive. That freaks me out. So thank you very much for <laughs> I have, keeping me on my agree. I have a partial answer to it though, which is that the depth and quality of our instruction gets the students more than they would get in meeting an individual single topic skill that they're trying to achieve. The, if they're coming to us, they're going to get that skill and they're going to get a much more holistic training and, and uh, skill building exercise there. Over right? the course of like three quarters, I could go on YouTube and watch something for 15 minutes. And, but we could make it easier, faster, you and get a put less barriers in their way getting into the program. But my, my, my MIT class is all on YouTube. Like right. they, that they're just, that's just where they house it. Mm -hmm. so I'll offer two thoughts on this because I feel like this is a, this is a learning session discussion. I'll point us back to the teaching and learning, learning session that this board had where we talked about teaching uh, really being about helping learners go beyond the given. So how do we really understand what that means in, op in operationalizing terms? And then the other thing we've talked about at least, uh, you know, over lunch in the office is, you know, we often point to Blockbuster Right, as no, that we don't want no to longer in existence. <laughs> right, um, but we also know that as a public higher ed system, we are never going to be Netflix. Right, we're never going to be on the bleeding edge of things. So, how do we think about becoming the Disney Plus, where we have all the credibility, all the resources, <laughs> all of the infrastructure, right, with some new things? Some Hamilton, some exciting new stuff that actually is able to bring those bring the majority of people together yes. in a way that really meets their needs, right? So how do we find that space where we can be nimble in a way that works um, while also moving in the direction where we need to go? And so just as we think about going forward, how do we, how do we hold a space that isn't all the way on YouTube, yeah. right? But is a way that is getting us in that direction more meaningfully. Uh, any Final, any other thoughts in for folks online? Member Shabazi? Yeah, if I understood the question is, um, what would it take to implement uh, the vision for success? So what would need to change? And uh, I'm gonna go back to what I wrote down from uh, what uh, Chief Benchita said. Um, inspiring people is our game plan for the next five years. And something like buy-in from leaders on the ground was critically important. And so I, I would say before we nail down what the answers are, what, what kind of tweaks we want to make to the goals, we got to be, we got to be inspiring, uh, inspiring people in our, from our local constituencies, and we have to get buy-in. And I personally think that that's going to mean that they have input on how are we going to tweak the goals? What's going to, what's going to be the strategy? How are we going to do this? What do we do about the governor's uh, uh, plan? So all of those things, I would say, let's listen before we answer. Get, get some feedback from the field. Again, have our local Senate, our local student Senate leaders, our local academic Senate leaders, CEOs, trustees, classified leaders, all of them giving some feedback to us so that this, whatever, um, whatever adjustments we're making, um, however we decide to accomplish the governor's, governor's plan reflects the input that we got. I think that would be an essential piece to having the kind of buy-in that, um, that I think Ben was asking for. I'd like to say something. Please. Using your uh, Netflix and that analysis, I think that the, the bottom line is that you're going to have to bring in people and, in, and empower them that have that kind of view. You have to make space for new ideas and empower them. 
And in terms of what um, Board Member Williams said, I also agree that there, unless our messaging is correct, there's going to be problems because our system is ongoing and the governor's system is temporary. That's just real. And so we, we're going to go hopefully through time and we don't know who the next governor is going to be. So there's got to be some sort of connection, but also understanding that we're the, we're the permanent force. Thank you, Member Sean, Member Shabazi, and thank you. Uh, any other thoughts or reflections on structure? I'll just, give one. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Felicia. No, I was just thinking about next meeting, right? Like, and 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 where we take this because Board Member Shabazian's comments, the comments about that Board Member Shaw and Williams have made around the buy-in, right? And mm -hmm. just how we like what what the, what our timeline is to create that buy-in. I think we have to figure that out because we the work is going to continue, and and but we also want to we want it to continue to evolve and not kind of just be stuck in the process, right? And so I just wanting to think about some of our next steps for September so we keep on moving the ball forward is, is something I think is important. Because I'm a little stuck because I had been thinking like, are we gonna, when he when Ben went through his presentation, I'm like, oh, are we supposed to update things and how are we gonna do that? Are you guys gonna do that for us? And then we're gonna approve it. But I just, it, I don't wanna get too stuck in the process piece, but but you know also realize that we, we shouldn't be firming things up until we get more buy-in and student input so. right clarity of process we mm -hmm. can work that out and bring that back to you yeah absolutely sorry Julian. the one thing that i think of is we have this system 73 districts 116 colleges uh or otherwise institutions we have a central repository of the curriculum that's being offered at all of these essentially but there's no coordinated articulation and even common course numbering is not going to create a coordinated articulation. We have got to do better in that sense so that students who take a class understand that that class could be called something different, could be numbered completely uh, differently and offered in a totally different division and yet still have the same core competencies mm -hmm. at exit. And that goes through looking at competency-based education and credit for prior learning. But that's how we're going to get to completion because so many of our students are taking the same type of class right. at multiple institutions because it's called something different or it's worth a unit more or it had this particular experience attached to it that the other place didn't. That's frustrating. And from a financial aid perspective, it's a waste of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. I like to say one other thing. <laughs> I'm talkative here. Yeah, that's um, what she said she you, wanted us to do. Uh, okay. That's okay. Um, again, I, I, you know, I think in, in, it, it's sort of in the big picture. And so I just think it's just important to come up with many, as many mechanisms as possible to focus on one of the, the agenda items, which is a sense of belonging. Because I think the things that were mentioned, the fear of failure, the mental health issues, the feeling of disconnection, which is happening nationally, locally, even in our neighborhoods, there's just a, a pause, there's a, just a feeling of disconnection. So anything that we can do to make people feel connected and belong, I think that that, that would certainly improve our overall condition. Let me just say that. That's it. Yeah. Could I just ask a question? What does the system call people who are not enrolled that like what, what do we call them? Who what's the I, common term that's like because I hear we always say students is what I hear, but all of those people that we're trying to attract, do we have a term for them? Uh, I don't know that we have a formal potential term students. for that. They're potent, I was just gonna say <laughs> potential <laughs> students. Former students, students, returning students, yeah. residents. Perspective, 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 perspective
Yeah. But let me just let me just acknowledge one thing. Um, you know, thank you for that question, Member Williams, on what do we call those students? Because I do know to your earlier question, don't we have a list? Don't we have a way of contacting those students who left us? That is the work that our colleges did during the pandemic, right? Everyone that took an EW or with you know took a withdrawal, they started picking up the phones. There were in 2020 when the pandemic first started, there were entire faculty and staff just volunteering their time to pick up the phone and call. That's the sense of urgency that I that I think of when you say that you want to inspire this system, right? Especially as we head into this third year of a pandemic or who knows what else will happen, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you for highlighting that. I just wanted to acknowledge that there are a lot of faculty and staff who have done a lot during this pandemic. And the League for California Community Colleges was at the center of organizing the CEOs and sharing that those were good strategies. So we'll continue to have that partnership. Cool. We'll hear you loud and clear. I, I have a say. quick question. Yeah. Please. Do we happen to know what percentage of those students who left uh, during the pandemic um, have decided not to return uh, due to having to be in person? I don't believe so. We do not. Yeah, no. Okay. I'm just wondering because if we look at what's going on just in the employment sector, a uh, high percentage of those uh, who were sent home to work remotely do not want to return to an office environment. So I wonder if we're facing a similar challenge with students who now realize that, hey, it's a lot more convenient for me to take classes from home and work part time and take care of my kids and do all the extra stuff that I need to do that I previously didn't have time to do because I had to spend so many hours on campus. So Blas, I can give you um, an example of one district, um, Los Rios. And so yes, yes. there are a number of students um, they haven't sort of, they've told us, but they haven't picked up the phone or sent us an email. What they have done, those students um, are not enrolling in, in on ground. There are now more students than expected because they cut, because there was a cut of online with anticipation that there would be a cadre of students that wanted to go on, uh, on ground. And that number isn't as big as it was thought to be. And so as students are not enrolling at the rate that they, the expectation were that they were gonna enroll, they are now enrolling in online and online courses are now increasing. The results of that for faculty is now faculty who really wanted, those who really wanted to be on ground are now having to teach like one on ground class and then one online class in order to meet the expectations of students. So that's how we're seeing, um, because students are telling us by virtue of, of, of how they're enrolling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, have, I have a question. Um, is there a formal study of our students that indicates their current va values and what do they want? Is there a current 22 study, or you know? Uh, are we just going by antidotes? I mean, where's the study? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not the expert on it, but what I will say is uh, I'll point to the slides that were shown previously that was a student survey uh, that highlighted what some of those needs and challenges are. So I think- Those we are the have, needs and challenges. I'm talking about the values. Oh, the oh. Mm, not, I don't, not that we're aware of. So, so we have a uh, survey in the field of both Sorry. Because we're saying that they don't value education that much and some of them are not working. So what do they value and, and what do they really want? So uh, we, we do have a survey in the field of uh, current returning students, prospective students, students who um, it does not specifically ask like their values specifically, but it asks a lot of questions around why did you leave? What would it take? What do you want? But not like, uh, not the more general, like, what is it that you care about? That's not part of the, the question set that we have. So we can't get at that exactly, but we will be able to get at some of the questions that all of you have been asking about. What are students, what are, their ask, what are they asking the colleges for to return? 
When, when, we, when will we get that information back? So um, that will be in the field until the end of August. We're mm -hmm. probably going to extend it a couple of weeks for September. the um, for the uh, quarter schools because they don't start right. until later. Uh, so theoretically, we should be able to have that end of September. So awesome. any kind of data that we get about the current mindset of our students will help us to craft the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, building on what President Haynes was saying, uh, I, I understand that there's not like a system-wide survey about what students would want from the attorney yet. Um, SMC did do a student survey about what we'd like to see in the future. Um, it was of current students and there was about 2000 responses, which is a good number for considering the student population. Um, and 50% said they would only take online moving forward. Um, and whether or not that was students who previously had experience online, there wasn't really a disaggregate of that. But um, the intention is to continue to survey students about that, but a similar experience with the enrollment um, they offered more on-ground on offerings, and all of them had to transition to online, a lot of them, because no one enrolled. Um, and so there, there is a disproportionate what students are currently wanting and, and showing up for and what potentially faculty and other, um, like what the institution is offering. Um, and another solution that adds on to the technology I mentioned earlier that I didn't bring up was the hyperflex modality, which is a classroom that has similar to what we're doing here, the cameras above where students can attend virtually, but those who wish to be in person can also be in person. Um, that allows a student who maybe had a car accident or car broke down or whatever it is, they're sick, they're not feeling well, to not miss class, but to attend still virtually and have that flexibility in their personal schedule to be able to attend whatever modality they feel like because both modalities are offered for the same section. Um, so that's another technology piece I would add on to what I said earlier. Thank you. If, if we could just expand just a little bit, I would love to know any individual district mandates that may have created enrollment obstacles especially for those districts that may have uh, mandated vaccination and booster requirements uh, for their students in order to attend on-campus courses, if that created any sort of divergence in their enrollment patterns. But more than anything, I would love to know who we actually lost because so many of the courses that previously at some institutions were not online, continued to not be online, but were regularly offered online by another institution. Did we just lose them from a single institution, but not from the system? Or did we truly lose them from the system? I would love to know that. Yes. If I could yeah. just uh, remark, I feel like this day, the planning and the preparation that went into it, that you presented, you presented a lot of bad news to us. You presented us some <laughs> needs directly from students. You're welcome. And, <laughs> and, and, and some, some very ambitious goals. And I think that we are collectively all very inspired to try to solve the problem and meet the need. Now, if time and staff resources were unlimited, imagine if we could repeat this kind of thing for every district and get all the stakeholders there and have them be as committed, as motivated as we are, that would be an unstoppable consensus. Quite well taken. I think that was a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was. it was fired up. Well, I mean, if you're gonna if you're going to really create the change we want, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to do. Like you have to you have to push districts and colleges to spend this time with our vision for success, with the roadmap to the future, um, and whatever our new document might be. I don't I don't know. And like I know we have like all the common periods. We do things where we do ask for feedback, and and obviously people come and provide input and. There's some people who might want to do that here today, um, you know, that, but that kind of focusing that kind of time and energy probably is what we need. I don't know if we have the, the ability to do that. So. That is a great transition 
actually to you, President Haynes, because <laughs> if you recall, I said, if, if, if we accomplish anything today, it's that you have models for the rest of the system, mm -hmm. what courageous conversations look like. That's what you did today. But the next phase is really going to be facilitated by President Haynes. And this is where you all get clarity on what direction you are asking me as the chancellor to take this office and the team in. Thank you. So um, and I, thank you so much for, um, for your commitment to this day, because I think that um, just not on behalf of myself. Um, the team that put this together, put it together at least three or four times in the, you know, <laughs> in the time um, between even just asking, um, do we want to have a retreat? And, um, and so it's really important to know the jujitsu that happened <laughs> from not two days, but one, not when it was scheduled, but later on, figuring out a time that people could actually show up and, and, and actually do the work. And then the, just the changes around information that came in on, an, on enrollment and how to then incorporate that piece into this conversation because we all knew that top of mind for everyone is this enrollment piece and what that looks like. And then having, having John and, and, and the team put together that information so that we could at least look at it mm -hmm. and, and speak to it in a way. So let, me, so let me be really transparent and let me be really honest. Um, I, We've been we've been on in this journey, and I recognize part of this was really. I keep on forgetting. I feel like I know everyone here, and and that isn't true. But I know you better now than I did in the in the past. A part of part of this um, was really getting us all on the same page, understanding what has transpired, understanding sort of where we are, and then also understanding where we need to go. And I'm, I'm only, this is, this is me speaking. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my colleagues on the board. It's not, I'm not speaking from that frame. I'm speaking as Pam Haynes, a trustee for 23 years and someone who has grown into who I am sitting on that board and grown into the things I care about really trying to, to listen. So I have listened. Um, we have been a little over five years, almost six years in this journey, and we've called it the vision for success. There is not a campus or a college that hasn't heard that term. Now, there are campuses and colleges that don't want to use that term, but it's not for lack of not ha having heard it. There are also colleges that have embraced the vision for success. Um, this is a big boat. And so the other piece that I have heard is, you know, there's some folks who are not in the boat. And there's some people and there's some folks who are sort of now hanging off the side of the boat and want to get in and want to have to and, and want to have to get in. And how do we help those? Um, this is a, this is a big system, 116 colleges, um, 73 districts. Um, and then there, and then it is a complex this, uh, system. At the core of it is seventy-three decision makers, as in terms of elected boards. And then it's it's even more complex in that we have constituency groups that we have to listen to, and then we have to make policy decisions as trustees. And some of us do that. And we, we really try to embrace what our role is. And sometimes we have to figure it out from the dais. Truly have to figure it out from the dais. Um, and so there are some really high functioning boards of trustees and there are also some low functioning boards of trustees. So, so I'm being really honest and really transparent. The question that I, I sit with relative to this is, um, do, we, do we move forward Communications will be critical to that. How we say what we what we say, and then what are what's the apparatus that we that we encourage 
we help to um, engage in with the, with, with the body of folks who are actually doing this work, with the body of folks who are started it but don't, that are having challenges, and also with the body of folks uh, on our college and in our districts, I'm on, I'm on it's, it's public, um, that don't care, <laughs> okay? There are colleges that say, mm, uh, this stuff is just not for me. And so the question becomes, yes, we, we want to give information to them because we do wish to engage them. But let me be real. There are going to be some that we, we won't, but not for trying. And what I want to say to you, the last five years is not want for trying. Okay. So this is my feeling, and, and I, and I, I want to say it, but, but I am a, a member of this board of governors, and I say that as well, that when I speak about the commitments, unless somebody tells me those are the wrong commitments, I believe we need to move forward. Because we have gotten through, in my estimation, a lot of the hard parts of this. Um, if someone says we need to tweak this and tweak that, tweaking is different than going back, sort of pausing, trying to get buy-in um, in a way that it, it stalls the work we've already done. I, I need to say that out loud, though. I need to say to stall because there are players in this field that will take any opportunity to stall. Now they may, oh, and that's a, okay, that's my word, but to pause, to rethink, we are, we are a system that loves process and that's good, but we need to do process along the way. It's my, and I'm again, speaking for Pam, um, because, I will still go back to where I started. Our students do not have the time. We will kill their dreams if we pause. We will kill their dreams if we act like, oh, that was for naught. Now we're going to have to do something else. If they hear that message, we are doomed. We are absolutely doomed. So. I want us to rethink about the words that we're using and what those implications may well be in what is heard, not maybe what our intentions are, okay? So that's where this board has taken leadership for the last five and a half years of really understanding what our mandate is, what our leadership role is, and, and, and embracing the commitments, the, the goals, the goals, we can, we can tweak those. We can, with the exception of closing gaps, equity gaps. We can't tweak that one. We got to move forward on those because that is at the crust of who our students are and what it is that they need. Absolutely. When we say 70% of our students are students of color, when we look at this democracy that is top on the brink of tumbling because we don't know what democracy means, these are the students that are going to be impacted by the, by, by the education that they're getting from us and the role that they will play in, in, the, in the present and in the future. So I'm, I'm going to, I'll leave it, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I want us to think seriously about the messaging as you said, Joe, the messaging will be critical. The words we use are impactful. The, the words that we use and the message that we send will be sending it to 1 million plus students and all of the 60,000 faculty and the other, I don't know, 60 or whatever number of, of other employees who work for our system and work on behalf of students. So I want us to think really importantly. Now, with that said, thank you for giving me my say. I really appreciate that. And I don't want that to quell anything that you have to say, because I have about three questions that I want to ask you. And the, and the, floor, will be, the floor will be yours. And I want to start off um, by, by asking, what, if anything, was missing from today's conversation or the information shared that needs to be considered in the future.
because we need a list <laughs> and the list needs to come from from us relative and it and if 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 you don't feel like you have an answer because we've been we've had a lot of information right now please feel like you can send that that information to to daisy you know and because it, it's it's never too late so but but there may be some things that I, I heard some things that were missing, but there may be some other things. So this is an opportunity that if you thought can think of something that um, was, was missing from the conversation um, uh, that really needs to be put on the list for the future. Julina. I'm, I'm going to dovetail off of something that member Shabazian said about bringing the conversation down to the lowest level. We have spent a lot of time focused on students, rightfully so, and their experience and bringing them back. But what about our employees? Their experiences cannot be ignored and they are different people that are coming back. Yeah. How That's can true. we also make sure that they are in the right space to help our students get to the right space? Very good, yeah. I'll build on that a little bit. Two different ways. One is, um, I think one of the points you're making is that the employee who left came back differently. Yes. Right? Yes. And I, I, I know as a member of the staff um, that had mentioned this during one of our meetings um, th that we needed to to be thinking about trauma informed care for our employees as much as our students. It's a piece of it. Um, we're now getting a little more removed from, from some of the trauma and a little more uh, engaged into what um, the normal has become for a lot of our colleges. And so the thing kind of front of mind for me right now is um, what innovations have been occurring in uh, modality in curriculum design um, that our, our faculty and our staff have learned new ways of doing business. They've learned modalities that serve the students well because they were forced to adapt really rapidly, but then they were able to refine those into a, a real thoughtful pedagogical approach. What do those look like and how can we foster that innovation more, right? Because we might be out of the, the heart of this pandemic, but the need to continue that innovation continues and the need to and that innovation will lead us, I hope, I think, to better meeting students where they're at mm -hmm. and having multiple modalities like this hyperflex model uh, that uh, member Alzano points out. And how can we take that, leverage it, find the best practices and share it out? And I know our academic senate knocks this out of the park all the time it, as far as the, the kind of sharing and, and development of these ideas. I'd like to hear a little more on, on those kind of innovations. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I, well, I appreciate your leadership for, for getting us here and for, your, for the team for um, getting the presentation and all of that stuff together because the information was really um, useful, helpful, and a chance to just see y'all. This is my first time seeing <laughs> some of y'all in, in person. Um, while I appreciated the, um, the student input, um, I would like to hear directly from some of the students that member um, Alizando um, talks about, like that unengaged student, because the students that I think we heard from would be successful regardless. And I'd like to hear from, you know, because I don't want to miss, like, what are the, all of those elements that, you know, we're hearing anecdotally that students want, and then a bigger sampling of students, you know, I think we should resource our student leaders to go out and mobilize in the focus groups like i'm like come to san bernardino like and like we will and and i do believe we got to bring in our nonprofit partners that can go and get to those students that are not engaging in the system i think if we don't hear from them we're not we're going to miss something mm -hmm. and if we just go off of the anecdotal um, elements that we hear, we're, we're really going to miss something if we don't hear them directly. I think, I mean, let's go to an apartment complex and meet in one of the um, community rooms and listen in here. Like, we should go 
out into the community or maybe at a church and just kind of really see if we're missing anything uh, because you know we got some big goals that we're after and then there's a lot of people that need to be engaged and we need to really kind of hear okay what are, what are we missing I think that's the only thing but everything else was I think was you know close to perfect and you know, I really appreciate it being in the space others so I mean I think I like the idea of being out I mean I know we it's difficult environment we're in right yeah, now where it's it. hard right yeah. but you know I I enjoyed the one time I got to go on a to to one of our, our college campuses with all of you right like you know you can do side visits here and there you can do virtual visits but it, there's nothing like being all together and um so thinking about that understanding that we live in this complicated COVID posture um I think also the point you made about the kind of the other elected of officials in the ecosystem, whether it's you know county support of supervisors, local chambers of commerce, if we're really going to continue to kind of move this in the direction of, of getting full buy-in from the community, um, there are another there those are important stakeholders for us to be talking to as well. And I feel like we've had some folks come in in the past, but it's probably a good time to maybe think about bringing some of those types of voices to the table again to see how it's working and but also i still want to see when it's not working like to, you know when we don't just have to see the a plus folks it's good to see the the b minuses um as well right um and uh c pluses whatever right like it's good to see that that mix of environments where this is working for us this is not working for us we may not be able to get those people that are just like not ever going to buy in but it would be nice to see um, some people who are a little bit in the middle um, on, on where we are in, pro in terms of kind of progress and, and buy-in. All right, then I'm gonna go to my next um, question. And that is, um, it's a question about um, what resonated for you and would be valuable to include in a future board learning session. What do you wanna hear more of that we didn't may not have had time to really sort of dig in. Are there some areas that we can in, in this next year um, develop as learning sessions? Can we just spend a whole day with Dr. Heads? You were loved, John. You were loved. Okay, one day with Dr. Hutz. <laughs> the data he provides us leads to so many additional questions. And to just be able to, to really dig deep into data elements and ask the questions. Yeah, we cut his, his presentation a little on the short side. I think we can remedy that. <laughs> I, I'm yes. also wondering a little bit, not so much for me, but for others. Um, I have the benefit of, of been in the system for almost 30 years and, and you know, on the ground with the students, um, but so many of our board members haven't. And so as we've developed a lot of these really important, impactful support programs for our students, uh, inside and outside our student services teams, um, that maybe there are, uh, maybe there are programs like an overview we can give uh, for some of the newer board members um, that kind of set a, a frame for what is happening on the campus as a student is engaging in their academic journey. And um, particularly as we're out and we have our own networks and we're in the community, but really being able to talk about things like the seed program and what does, what kind of components our college is doing? What are some best practices in student equity at local campuses that they've done, what innovations are occurring there, um, but uh, but really kind of getting getting a little bit deeper in the weeds on the student experience side of things. I wonder it might be for some of those that that haven't participated at a local campus very much. Any other ideas? I think um, someone was mentioning, um, and I'm thinking about us start beginning to take action, us going out and representing a specific region, but. And in John's presentation, just what are the regional gaps? We were looking at that um, section over there and it talked about equity. And, and we talk about those terms in real broad, um, you know, we talk about them in real broad, in a real broad sense, but what are the actual regional gaps that you see 
um, you know, in, in, you know, in Orange County or, you know, however you decide you want to do the regions, whatever makes sense, but allowing us to get specifics. And then, you know, and then one other thing is just like, how do we take action to start moving forward? Like, how do we get started? Like more in-depth conversations on direct actions that, you know, we as bond members should be taking. I don't know what those are, but, you know, what do you want us to do? Any, uh, yes. Um, something we didn't necessarily touch on today, but it's in the world of improving educational outcomes, I think. Um, I know students have been greatly appreciative of the extension of the pass no pass deadline. Um, and I have previously brought up how can we look at having the withdrawal deadline also extended um, so that students are not penalized within the first week of class, not knowing if they want to drop a class that it will show up on their transcript. Um, I know that that probably also will tie into maybe needing to look at the funding formula and how colleges are given funding based on how much class the student is um, has completed versus just the first couple weeks of class. So maybe looking to the world of the funding formula and also the deadlines for students in terms of their completion, I would like to circle back on. I don't see any. Um, uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we have a very uh, high bar set for us by the governor and several deadlines associated with our work on that. And I would love for us to have a strategic planning meeting around interim goals we need to meet in order to make the governor's goals. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we answered today was, you know, what's the biggest thing that we can we can tackle the lowest hanging fruit on this report that we can tackle immediately and i feel like if we divided and conquered on that so we wouldn't have to pick and really lean into the expertise of each board member we could have a strategic planning session just like this one where all our energy was devoted to making progress on those goals because this is a huge deal and i would hate for us to make this an agenda item on a regular meeting and have to you know give it some time constraints i think we really need the time the energy and the space to nerd out on what interim goals and long-term goals look like maybe I'll, I'll add on that a little bit um and this would really be up to the, the leadership to decide whether it's something that they find palatable or not but um bringing in uh, as part of a discussion like that, bringing in these other stakeholders and constituent groups to to engage with us on that in, in, in a setting like this, yeah. where um, you would have, I mean, heaven forbid we go terribly crazy in it, but like consultation council members, right? The constituencies there and really be able to engage board and consultation kind of together, um, really identify where do we have structural things that we can tweak and how do we meet this interim goal and what does it take systemically to reach that right I so i think that. there's probably a deeper dive on some of this that the organizations may have experience and expertise that we may be lacking. that's a heavy ask because it, it gets pretty active but i wrote it down anyway <laughs> can i throw in social media um the chancellor's office has a social media president the board of governors um, I don't know if we do or don't. I don't think we do. No, we do it through the office. Yeah, yeah. so like if leaving here today, should, what's the message we all should be sharing? Like, you know, so some kind of coordinated, a conversation about like communications for box. Like what are the messages we should amplify? A communications plan that our team can put together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a future conversation about that. We're learning. We have a great team that can help us with that. Okay, um, and then, and then my um, sort of last question, sort of and comment. Um, so uh, we only sort of slightly mentioned that as a board, we were awarded the National ACCT Equity Award just last week. Um, That's applause. Yeah. Oh, that requires applause. Applause.
Well, let me just say a little a little about that. Um, a bit more than um, 15 years ago, I was at an ACCT conference. It was actually, it was probably longer than that. Um, it was when um, Obama first became president. And, um, and so um, that presidency started in January as it would normally do. And then the, the, um, the ACCT um, legislative um, summit was in February. And I happened to be invited to an, a, a kind of closed session meeting of which I wasn't supposed to be there, but I got invited. So therefore I went and got to listen. Um, let me just say that I was one of only two Californians in the room that weren't um, appointees by the Obama administration. And, um, and it was very interesting. Um, it, uh, this was a, a group of about 30. Okay, so two. Now, when I listened to the conversation, the conversation was really focused in on some policies that the Obama administration wanted to make changes to relative to two-year institutions. Uh, and the voices in the room had a very different perspective because most of the na nation um, has really high fees in their two-year institutions. And so the, the kinds of changes they were talking about did not apply to us at all. And yet we were gonna be held to some criteria that we'd had no say in. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting back and listening and I really didn't have a, a, a role to play. And I, I don't see myself as timid, but it was really not the right time for me to say, hey y'all, I'm from California and I think you're doing it all wrong. So I didn't do that, but I did come back. Um, and this was um, probably my first term as, um, a, uh, a member of the triple CT board, the, the league board, the trustee side. So I came back with my colleagues and I said, you know, I sat in this meeting and we were not there. Not in this meeting, we were not there. The West Coast was not there um, relative. So there was nobody from Seattle, nobody from Portland, nobody from the West Coast. This was really, really sort of the Eastern Southern Seaboard perspective in a bit of the Midwest, Minnesota. And that's and that for the most part was the league. And I, and I said, we've got to change this. Do we have anybody on these boards? And then we had a few. So one of my, and I'm sorry, this is a long thing, but I think it's important to know that we've come a really long way because my recommendation, my suggestion was We've got to be much more engaged in what is happening there because decisions are being made and recommended that we just not privy to. We get the, the outcome of that, which is we shall do things differently. And then we say, but that ain't us. Um, so, that, so that relationship has changed. Ergo, um, we have a Pacific region that is much more engaged in what is happening in on the West Coast and in the Pacific region than we've ever had before. Ergo, part of this is somebody is noticing the work that this board and this system is doing. Um, it might have taken a little while to get there, but we we are there in and, and, and no small part to the reforms and the transformations that we have been about for the last five years in particular. And so I wanna commend us as a body, but I also wanna commend all of our partners that were not named in this award because we all should embrace this award as our award because nobody does this work by themselves. We all need each other. And so, um, I just wanted to tell you that story because it, it has always um, been of interest to me why we were not initially in the room, but it doesn't matter now. We are in the room and, um, and somebody, um, some group of people have recognized the work that we've done here in California. So, um, so, so with that, um, there is a question in here someplace. Let me see if I can find it. Um, 
Have I already said it? Well, let me just say this. Um, there is a part, we have a, we have a few, we, do we have a few more minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um, there's a, there is a question in this and it's, it was, I want, I want you, I want us here to imagine that it is 2030. What would be the difference about the California Community College System? In other words, what about the student experience, the structures, and the outcomes that would help more students complete their educational uh, education equitably? So we're we're forward looking. We're forward looking to seven years from now. What would be different from right now as we see our system? and all the changes that we indeed have made, mm -hmm. wh what does that future look like for, for our students and the student experience? What, what so I'm gonna, I, I have my answer, but I'm, I'm gonna wait to hear y'all's answer. I'll jump in again and just say, uh, one component of that would be um, holistic support of our students for the total cost of attendance, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that includes mm -hmm. all the wraparound services right all the all the basic needs and uh relieving from our students the obligation to uh, meet all of life's challenges and be successful in in our coursework that we expect to be as rigorous or more rigorous than any of our uh, intersegmental partners right uh, if we can relieve that burden of the, the cost and effort into figuring out all these other pieces of adulting and they can just focus on succeeding academically we're going to unlock their potential and the opportunity that they have uh, that currently they're being held back from thank you i mean to that point i, I think um some of the uh, the work that's being done around housing options for for folks um you know, really seeing some of that come to fruition and, and have real pipelines um, in place that, you know, it's not just on a few select campuses, but it's 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 something that in a more robust way, our, our, our colleges are able to actually provide those student housing options um, because that is and that does end up being a really big barrier for folks. Yeah. Um, and on um, the point that board member Elizondo made just about, um, you know, being as creative as possible in terms of the offerings that we're off that we're providing to folks so they have those flexible options um and can do it juggle everything they need to do taking care of their their kids and family you know having that part-time job but also being able to take um take classes and 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 meet their goals and their objectives those are two things that stand out to me i would say um understanding what a federation plus would look like I want to elaborate. I don't know if 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 a federation is the right way to think about the way we should be achieving horizontal and vertical alignment. And if we could get very granular about the things that are not right with a federation and take it to a different model, we might be able to be more responsive. To our students' needs, Jolena. Looking at both the comments from Felicia and Hildy, I envision as we see more students taking certain courses online or even hybrid, that we'll be able to repurpose some of our structures so that we can accommodate the housing concerns and still meet the students where they need us to be and the employer's expectations on a regional level, whereby we might find that certain community colleges highlight their course offerings that are not duplicated anywhere else within the region so that students would essentially do the majority of their general education in a hybrid or online but that practical hands-on employer driven um, expectation would happen on campus and it would be very immersive and they would be surrounded not just with faculty but faculty mentors that are in their discipline in their industry building that pipeline that's putting them in those occupations that have the living wage 
I believe in seven years, every general education course will come with a textbook. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Or not need one. I think you should be more optimistic. <laughs> but within seven years, within oh, okay. seven years, within, within, within seven years, will come with the textbook. And I would add to that also um, that the courses we teach would be available in whatever modalities work best for our students. Yes. That would empower those in communities that are maybe further removed from a campus to engage effectively, especially as we try and address the uh, digital divide regarding high speed internet. Well, if we're going lofty ambitions. She was like, we, look, like I need more staff. Yeah. Yeah. How about we envision a system where a student could decide any day of the week, any week of the month, any month of the year that they're ready to begin? Amen. Yeah. Open entry. Open and entry. let's we get actually them have that. where Cal they Bright. need to go as expeditiously as possible. We actually have that in our system. We have Calbright. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. At scale. You're really yeah, trying we're to make it hard for us, actually. At scale. <laughs> but floss. You're really trying to make it very difficult for our vets. <laughs> Come on. And, and that's so. those are the constraints that we have to consider because our financial aid system is not aligned to anything outside of an academic calendar. And they really need to become more nimble. But that's problematic. Yeah, I think on the VA side, it's going to be a challenge, but um, <laughs> oh, um, the money? It, yeah. uh, it's it's very specific in terms of when, uh, as far as how you get your monthly stipend, um, when the semester starts, when it actually ends, when you can drop your classes. Um, I think we need a, a much stronger relationship as a system with the Department of Veterans Affairs to make sure that any policy uh, or any new, yeah, any policy that gets implemented does not negatively impact our veteran and student uh, military family populations because we're not following the federal VA guidelines as well. And I think that this system as uh, I would, I'll, I'll use the, the word powerful and influential as it is, um, has the ability to help create legislation or policies that will improve the lives of our student veterans so that when something like, unfortunately, like the pandemic happened, we can react quickly, uh, but also look forward and reach out to those powers that be on the VA side and say, look, this is what our student population needs in California, and this is what will apply to the student population throughout the country because we often, you know, when those changes are made, um, it takes time for those policies to, on the other end of it, to be implemented in a way that we do not hurt our population. So Bloss, what I'm, I'm hearing from you is that, that. What, what I'm hearing from you is that we're, we wanna eliminate barriers for veterans participating in our educational institutions, particularly our community colleges. Absolutely. <coughs> Got it. Um, I don't know what the current yes. numbers are, but I'd love in 2030 to see that, that all high school students at least saw the value of a college education and essentially all of them came and got a certificate or a, an AA degree or transferred to a university or went directly to a university and got a baccalaureate degree. So I, I wish two things. Um, one of them, um, what I would say is we have now, for many of our college campuses, um, um, embraced dual enrollment, sort of fully. We said we embraced it prior to the pandemic, but it was sort of kind of. We've embraced it fully because our enrollment demands it. Um, and so it, it is an opportunity to reach um, and dual enrollment um, over the last several years has been redefined for those who um, should be thinking about college, but we have not, we've not engaged them to say, oh, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So those two things 
uh, provide an opportunity if we take advantage of that on our community co colleges and in the work that we're doing to increase those number of students who in their junior year and some and some will be going down to their sophomore year new and, and became um, students on, on their campuses in terms of dual enrollment. And by the time they reach their high school graduation, we'll have 15 to 30 units, which means so much more relative to their trajectory of continuing their education. So we've reached down. So that's one of the things that I hope. And then the other is this, I'm gonna give you some statistics, some, some numbers. And then I'm going to tell you why this is so very important. Um, on, on this college campus, on this in this college environment, I shouldn't say campus, 24% um, of the student body is Black, 31% are Latinos, 12% are Asian, and 6.5% of them are Native American. Um, this is this is a campus that has. Um, embraced um, flexibility, short-term certificates, and, um, and um, um, programs that are linked to a job that it has been researched enough to know exactly where those jobs are and who those employers and who the, where those industries lie. This college now has a little over, well, little over a thousand students. It's getting closer to about 1,100 students. It is in the realm of many of our much smaller college campuses. And um, it has also embraced competency-based education. What I will say is that every college in our system can do the same thing if it chooses to do so. And this is Calbright. And so it is, and it has been, it has been designed and framed in a way that whatever we learn in that college setting, we give it away. Can't, this is not, we're not holding on. This is not um, what you call it, um, um, something that we brace and say, oh, it's only us that can do it. But we do, we need folks to be open-minded ab about that. So what I am hoping that um, in these next seven years, that we begin to, um, to be supportive of some of the things we're learning. The nation is watching Calbright. There may be folks in California that might not be watching Calbright, but the nation in these in these spaces is watching Calbright because if we can do a public option that takes away some of the obstacles for our students, um, we also have a hundred a hundred folks who have gotten a certificate out of this in the last two years. We need to expand that, and we need to frame it and have accountability that our, our the students in it are getting what they what they need from it. But that's the. That's the North Star for flexibility. That's the North Star for the part of the governor's commitment to us um, about how we are going to change the trajectory of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of adults who need another option, mm -hmm. including our own. This is just one of one of what could be many. So that's my, those are my two aspirationals between now and 2030. So that's, that's kind of it. Unless anybody has a dying, not a dying, but a, what do you call it? Um, Final? A, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> anybody has something that they want to add before I go to public comment? I just have one thing and it's not as aspirational as 2030, but I'm hoping that by 2023, we can figure out how to uh, break down the silos between the governing boards of the three systems. Because if we're supposed to be working together to I achieve agree. so many things in the vision for success, I don't think I've ever met a member of, of each of the governing boards. I've never met the presidents of each of the, of each of the systems. And I think we need that face-to-face -face accountability that we're in this together. Yeah. I'm with you on that. So um, before I go to public comment, I just, from my heart to your heart, thank you so much for spending this day. I hope you got out of it as much as I did. I got a lot out of it. And I really appreciate the time that 
we all have spent together. Some of us for the first time and others um, we've met on other occasions. But um, again, thank you very, very much. So with that, um, I'm gonna open up for um, um, open forum, which is public comment. Public forum is now open. We will begin in Sacramento and finish with virtual comments. For virtual attendees, please use the raise hand feature. If you're calling in, hit star nine. You'll have a maximum of two minutes. I do not believe we have any in-person comments, but we do have two hands raised and I will hand it over to Gary. Actually, Jenny, I think you, I think I saw your hand raised. She did. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, President Haynes and uh, Chancellor Gonzalez and members of the board. Um, I just want to say thank you for your openness, for your candidness, if that's a word, in your strategy planning session today. It's been enlightening, um, educational to learn your goals and your thoughts and what you're thinking about. And I would also like to congratulate you on your award from ACCT. That, that's a wonderful, you have really earned it. And so I look forward to sharing what the Academic Senate is doing with you and um, enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there other comment? Uh, yes, we do have two hands raised. Gary, are you with us? Yes. Um... Uh, L. Rose, you have control of your mic and you can address the board. Thank you very much. Um, well, the, I'm kind of new to this forum, but I just want to mention I am, uh, I have played all of the roles that were discussed today. I've been a student in the community colleges. I am now or have been a professor. I'm a voter who votes for funding that goes to community college districts and I'm an employer. I want you to know why I have decided, I decided a couple of years ago to stop voting yes on bonds to fund uh, community college districts. Uh, and that is because I have seen in all of these roles, a lack of currency uh, going on that is really making students suffer. During the last, during the pandemic, I got an additional five certificates in uh, particular skills and competencies that I might have been able to get in the community colleges, save for the fact of, the, uh, of how out of date and not current are a lot of the instructors and who are instructing. Some of these are associates and colleagues, and I love them to death, but they are not current. They have not gone to, some of them have not taken a class and updated their skills in years, there is nothing compelling them to do that. And the result of that is students like me who go and say, forget it, I'm taking my hundreds of dollars and I'm going seconds. elsewhere. Uh, I have a lot more to say, but um, it, it, you know, can't do it in the 30 seconds, but please, please, for God's sake, uh, make your tenured uh, professors go and, and demonstrate currency. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Stevie Carpenter. You have control of your mic and can address the board. Hello, my name is Stevie Carpenter. Um, I'm a student in LACCD. Uh, and my concern is about uh, matriculation and assessment, uh, more specifically AB705. So I've uh, sent a report uh, to, I believe her name is Christina Castro, uh, detailing information about the effects of AB705 and how it's affecting the Los Angeles school districts um, and mostly the nine uh, colleges. Also too, when you read the AB705 um, legislative council digest, uh, it puts the Board of Governors of California responsible for what's happening within these colleges. Um, not only that, I've been a tutor for 10 years. So I've tutored uh, within LACCD high schools, middle schools, privately, elderly, um, blind students, uh, students with autism. And this bill in no form helps those individuals. Uh, even when you think about programs like EOPS, TRIO, Guardian Scholars, um, Next Up, this bill does not provide um, 
the right information or preparatory work that students need in order to be successful in these classes. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, within LACCD, they have classes called um, Math 167. Um, they used to have Three math. Seconds. Um, and when you observe those classes and what they actually detail, uh, after, when I tutor the students, those classes do not prepare the students for Math 227. Um, also, with the current placement of using high school transcripts and self-reported uh, grades, it's placing a lot of students in transfer level classes that they're not ready for. And there's research that shows that a lot of students are actually failing those classes. And the rate of success for English and math uh, transfer level classes are actually- Thank increasing. you, that's time. President Haynes, there are no additional hands raised. So with no further public comment, I think we're now adjourned. Thank you. Nice. And we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. Thank you. I made Daisy Thank the you best. guys for a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This concludes the Board of Governors Strategy Session, 4 o'clock p.m. Thank you all. Safe travels. Bye. YouTube lost. Join safe and lost.